At least you're consistent. Father God, thank you for another beautiful day. Let us not take any of them for granted. He bless us with so much. And while so many of us have heard about another tragic situation in the school in Nashville, thank you for giving those two officers the courage to do what they did to, to reduce any more tragedy. Give us the wisdom here, administration, board, to meet the needs of our community and help in the areas that that we really need help with. We ask for your wisdom, your guidance, in your name. Amen. 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 I will now call to order the workshop agenda meeting for March 28, 2023. Welcome citizens of Clay County. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend today's school board workshop. This workshop is our opportunity as your elected representatives to collaborate openly among ourselves and make decisions that will decide the future direction of our public schools and the education of our children here in Clay County. There will be an opportunity for the public to ask questions at the end of the workshop presentation. Questions will be allowed, public comment will not be allowed. If you wish to ask a question, please fill out a comment card and hand that card to a deputy. Your participation is welcome and appreciated. Um, we're going to adjust the um, order of a couple of items on our agenda. Originally, we were going to jump right into the agenda review. Um, but instead we're going to hear from Mr. Scromolo about our use of facilities. So a couple things before Mr. Scromolo starts, we can get up there. So the, the use of facilities policy was adopted in 2020, and the purpose was to kind of gain some control from outside organizations but then using our, our facilities. Over time we noticed some changes needed to be done, and that's pretty much what Mr. Scromolo was going to talk about. Right. Mr. Brasky, sorry to interrupt, but just a procedural thing. Um, is Miss Bola attending by phone? She is not. not. So Miss Bola is not with us today. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good morning, board members. Uh, I'm excited to present this item to you. Just some small changes we need to make to the uh, facility grounds and, and usage manual. They told me when I became an athletic director, you're the AD, which stands for all duties. So this, is, this falls <laughs> under all those duties. But just a couple of quick changes. You know, Mr. Broski mentioned in the summer of 2020, the board, uh, for our new board members, the board revamped this policy to... Um, adjust some pricing, add in our COVID protocols, and then also adjusted some facilities that could and could not be used. Uh, so over the past three years, we've evaluated what that actually looks like in practice. You know, for our school district, it is vital that we have good partnerships with our community members um, and businesses and those types of folks uh, in our school system. So three quick adjustments that we're gonna make today. Uh, the first one is on page six of the document that you have in front of you. We needed to update the Florida High School Athletic Association verbiage uh, to be in compliance with FHSA policy 23.3.6, which states that school facilities can be used for off-season training, barring that a facility usage agreement is on file. So we're putting that into policy to make sure that we're in line with the FHSA requirements. The second thing we're doing, we're removing all of the COVID protocols. You know, we haven't been practicing that since the policies have been sunset, but it's important that the board policy reflects that, um, that all those protocols are going to be removed. That's on pages seven, eight, and nine, showing the deletion of those items. And then finally, uh, the, the biggest part of this is we needed to expand our definition of enrichment. So, like I said, our school district has so many great partners that provide wraparound services to our students. And that's not just in the summer, that's also in the, in, during the school year. And the, the, the way the policy was written, it just said summer enrichment. So we're increasing that to after school to give us the latitude uh, for those partners to provide services to our students. And lastly, page 10, uh, risk management needed to update um, some verbiage for insurance purposes. And uh, other than that, that's all I've got to, to the policy. Are there any questions? I have a couple. Mm -hmm. So if we're not required to do all the cleaning, the COVID cleaning, um, and I guess this is more a question for the board, um, is that something that we want to consider reflecting in a price adjustment to the use of our facilities? And then um, the other question that I have, and this would be a question for staff, 
Um, I know we had, we were supposed to be moving to an online format for availability of facilities. Are we still? We are. We are. It's currently in place. Facilitron. And so for the public, is that accessible from our website? Where would they go to find that? Yeah, so if you just go on the website and under departments, you can click facilities and it has Facilitron on there. Okay. Uh, the feedback, and I will also, uh, Dr. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's also on the business of the website. You can, you know, under um, risk, you, okay. the, the, the link is there so that they can um, easily access. Yeah. And I'll just say it's been a, a great improvement for the district in terms of especially from a school-based level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a much more timely and efficient manner to get things approved and those types of things. Okay. And it also helps community members because it's almost like an a la carte, you know, it's an Airbnb type. You know, you, you click what you want, it shows you how much it's going to cost. Um, they check insurance for us, which helps us with speed and those types of things. So it's been a, it's been a welcomed addition. Have we seen a trend? up or down of the use of our facilities outside of district use? That'd be a good question. Um, I would say um, yes, we have. I think the schools, you know, the ones, probably mainly the high schools are the ones that are used to utilize, taking advantage of it uh, more frequently than it has been in the past. I think the uh, the availability of use of this website or this, this third party has helped us keep a better accountability of what's really going on at the school, uh, at, the, at, the, at those sites. Okay. So, yeah. And I know we have some requirements for um, staffing the school when it's Correct. being used, yeah. and that was related to COVID as well. So is that something you're looking at? Well, it, uh, it's a combination. The staffing, of course, um, uh, as it relates to even, not even COVID, um, the clean, clean, cleaning the building to get it back to where it, it's, we can use it again. Um, that was one of the requirements, um, and I believe that was in place before. Yeah. It's just we just made it, um, put it, placed it on paper, put it in a policy. Um, as far as um, the other staffing, the um, the officers. Um, I think now because of safety and security, that is a requirement as well, depending on the number of folks that's in, in the, um, in the, at the event. And I think that's common for just any event, really, that you, know, you do have the proper um, safety measures in place. Right. So, so all, the, all the removal of the COVID portion of things really just affects the amount of time and, and the process for cleaning the building, not really the personnel that does it. Right, and, and remember the requirements for COVID, it was mandatory that we do these things, and now we're just lifting those and right. to answer your question about the fee, that is the COVID cleaning fee is removed mm -hmm. oh, with the yeah. policy. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Scrimmel. Okay. So there'll be an agenda item for um, for advertising. So you'll see that with, that within the uh, the confines of it. So moving on to the other part. You might have noticed the size of the, uh, the folder today, and this doesn't include everything. So I'm going to estimate over a thousand pages uh, of stuff. Now I'm going to make this. 861. As, what's that? 861. 861 now, but we haven't included all of the reappointments, which will be about a 200 page document that will be added within the 48 hour rule. So I'll attempt to go through this as, as quickly as possible. So just starting from the beginning, some of the recognitions that maybe you should you know, know about. President's Volunteer Service Award recipients, we're gonna honor them. Uh, also, Maria from AMI Kids received the Florida Juvenile Justice Association Service of Excellence Award. She'll be uh, there for that. We're gonna recognize the winners of our Black History Month essays students who are going to be recognized. We have state wrestling champions from Middleburg and Fleming Island High School, and it also happens to be School Library Month, uh, and that's going to be recognized. In addition, Middleburg Elementary uh, is on our showcase, and last Friday we honored Becky Wilkerson. I saw Miss uh, Miss Hanson and, and uh, Miss Clark there for that. Florida Tax Watch is an organization that recognizes school leaders. She's their principal of the year, one of their principals of the year. Also, the cool thing was a student there at Milburg Elementary got a two-year scholarship at, at that event. And the funny story is there, I received the email from Florida Tax Watch, 
And when I first received this email, I thought to myself, well, this can't be good. Right, the Florida Tax Watch, just the name of the organization. So I sat there with so that, you know, after a, a couple of times of playing the dance, I finally just called him up and said, hey, what, what is this? Tell me what's going on. And it turns out, Becky is uh, certainly a great leader. He's been there for 19 years mm -hmm. as principal and kind of a rock or a pillar of the university community. Becky Wilkerson, so we'll honor her. In addition, in case you missed it, we did have a special guest that came to Clay County last Thursday, Governor DeSantis was at Ridgeview High School. He was there to tout civics education across the state of Florida. Uh, and I would just say it was a great event and it did my heart good, the positive comments that Governor uh, DeSantis made about education, education particularly in Clay County. He made the, the comment, it seems like every time he has a new initiative, he comes to Clay County to, to announce it. He was here three times mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. in recent years, which is pretty good showing for a governor and kind of shows the, the excellent work that everyone does in the education uh, sector. Uh, the, the civics program itself, let me just say this, we had 17 teachers who were part of that first cohort. We have 153 currently in cohorts two and three, currently going through the process now. 620 on the wait list. And of course, the state's going to do 20,000 and then kind of work from there. So things you might not know, uh, Clay County itself ranked first in the state of Florida. Yes, that's first in the state of Florida for seventh grade civics, fifth overall for all civics education, K-12. So certainly civics education is alive and well in Clay County and we do a great job. I always say that patriotism is never out of style in, in Clay County. Something else that I like to geek out a little bit, those of you that don't know me, like if I get like a chart of numbers, I like to look at that, analyze where we are. Just received this from the state. It has to actually do with energy costs, right? You would think, how boring could this be? But what it does is it takes the square footage that each district has, which in our case is 6.7 million square feet of buildings, and then it analyzes energy costs and compares districts, right? You can't take data in isolation and just only look at the data, how much does it cost? Then you have to take a look at everybody else and say, well, how's everybody else doing, right? Because they're under the same conditions that we are. So we came in ninth in total energy cost, meaning the ninth cheapest amount of money spent on energy for the 6.7 million square feet. Fourth in the state when, when calculated by the first student, okay? so. We do have a program called Synergistics, which is used as a model to, um, to reduce energy costs. And I thought that that was kind of an interesting little factoid for everyone. Now to the, to the agenda. All right. So number one is the minutes. I don't think that there's any, any questions there. Two is legislative priorities. You know that we've done this twice now. Now it's just the official portion of having it on the board. And, the board agenda uh, will eventually create uh, flyers for Clay Day, etc. Remember, we have three appropriations that are going through the legislature right now: one on Elevation Academy, one on Workforce Development with our Health Care uh, Program, Health Science Program at Fleming Island High School, and expansion of school choice through Montessori. So, all of that is going on behind the scenes. Next, we have personnel consent agenda. Uh, a, a ton of information on here. One additional one that we're currently working on is the Director of Network Security. Uh, Steve Amberg, a longtime employee of the district, is, is leaving, and so we want to revamp that job description um, you know, coming up, and so you'll see that one in there also. Next is Kelly Services. One of the things I'm asking the, the board to do is to create an incentive for those uh, substitutes that are at certain uh, schools. What we've seen is we have a 602 active substitutes in Clay County. An average of 250 substitutes are called a day. So, so far this year from August when we started school through March 17th, just because we had to cut off the, the data, 30,429 substitutes were requested. 
of that, Kelly service is filled 27,266 of those, which is a 90% fill rate. What we have noticed is that there's 10 schools in particular that we're having some challenges with. And what we, what we wanted to do, and what this basically does, is it creates a $25 incentive per day for individuals to go there to be substitutes for the remainder of, of the year. Because what will happen is, especially when you get into spring and, and all of that, the usage of substitutes actually goes up as you go forward. So this is a proactive way in which to deal with this particular issue. Uh, over time, we've done several things. With, with We've been quite creative when it comes to substitutes to the board's credit. We had substitute teams. We had individual building substitutes. We tried four or five different strategies. And of course, this is a statewide, nationwide challenge. This is one thing that we could do uh, in order to help uh, our schools, particularly those 10 schools that are listed within there. Questions about that one? Everybody's good? Okay, proposed supplement allocations. This might be the first time for some board members to, to see the supplement allocation package. Every April, we bring this package uh, to you. This will be a listing of, of all supplements throughout the district that are given. You know, some of the things that you look for in a supplement package is you'll notice equity. Every elementary school has the same supplements, and these would be uh, supplements that would be paid for additional work outside of contracted hours for both um, both uh, SESPA and, and our teachers uh, related to that. You'll notice a slight increase in the cost because we're opening up a new school, uh, and that's part of the new cost. So if there are questions about it, because I realize it's a lengthy document, um, I'm glad to take any phone call and answer any question you might have about a supplement that's going on out there. But that's a huge thing that happens every April, okay? Because the reason why it happens in April is you have to post those jobs and, and hopefully have somebody for that uh, before summertime, before you come out for the summer. Yes? I don't know if this is a, a quick response or not, but sure. what kind of process goes into figuring out, let's say, athletic, the amount of money for like athletic supplements versus academic supplements? So one of the things you have to do is one key indicator of difference between athletics and academics and, and uh, is the number of people that participate within a sport, the size of the school. That creates what you'll see is when you look at the academic supplements, they're pretty much the same at every school, right? Then when you look at the athletic supplements, you might say, well, those, there's a different amount. Well, there's a different number of coaches for supervisory purposes based on the number of students. The more students you have, it makes sense the more coaches that you would have um, supervising those students. So it's that's how you figure out the, the financial? Right, and, and the challenge is, it's like some schools have certain sports, some schools don't. For example, um, the board approved a lacrosse supplement. Lacrosse is, is not at every school. Uh, the supplement is for Fleming Island High School, which has that program. So not every school has the same athletic programs. Not every school has the same number of students that participate and therefore there's slight fluctuations. And so in terms of the, of the budget, sorry, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. In terms of the budget, how, how do we compare with our athletic supplements? Our, athletic, our athletic supplements similar. are actually uh, pretty decent. Of course, John left, right, as this mm -hmm. question came up, but there was, there was a study, there's a whole analysis that was done in comparison to other <coughs> like-sized districts. And what we found is that ours are very competitive if not, not good. Um, I would also point out to you that there's a lot, of, a lot of information in the news right now about Georgia, which has significantly higher compensation when it comes to coaches than the state of Florida and how people are leaving the state of Florida to go to Georgia. So I guess it's relative. I would say this, we're very competitive in like-sized districts in the state of Florida, not competitive when compared to our neighbors to the north in Georgia. So that's why there's increases and changes on the athletic side, but not so much on the, like a department head or academic side. Right. Now the, the actual percentages, the, the amount that's paid in supplement is based on a percentage. 
that percentage is located within our contract and that's negotiated each year that there, that there was going to be a the academic portion right and the athletic both of those the percentages okay. are listed within the contract um, my question was about student access to sports so if Fleming Island is the only campus with lacrosse are your students from other schools eligible to try out for that team or do you have to be a student at Fleming Island you have to be a student at Fleming Island by FHSA rules. Okay. Doesn't stop any school from wanting if there's an interest from mm -hmm. forming that, and that's how that actually started in Fleming Island because right. the people of that community decided that was a sport they wanted. They took the initiative to say we want this sport, and uh, they've had it for a couple of years now. That they've had that any school is welcome to do the same thing if, had, if there's an interest of students. We would then look at adding that program up to that. And obviously, you need a coach, too. So. Yeah, yeah, and somebody that. Okay, so now we're on to reappointments. Reappointments is one of those processes that, that happen. Remember, we evaluate all of our 5,000 employees by this point in the school year, and then the process, the next process is to reappoint them for the next school year. So you will, within the 48 hour mark, get a big document. This is the only time that we take reappointments separate from the personnel consent agenda. Typically, if you look at the personnel consent agenda, it'll have reappointments embedded within there. In fact, it still does, okay? So when we do the massive one in the spring where we're reappointing most of our 5,000 employees, we, we go ahead and we create a separate item for that because it'll be um, 200 pages of names within there. So at this point in the year, we go ahead and we reappoint our, our PSC teachers, our CC teachers, our AC teachers, as well as our support employees, provided that everything has been complete at this point. So not every name goes onto this agenda. So what might be a case where it's not on the agenda, right? Teachers have to renew their certificate. If you don't renew your certificate and your expiration date was June 30th, of 2023 and you haven't completed that, your name does not appear on the list. So it's kind of like you have to meet all the requirements in order to be reappointed, okay? Uh, you have to also have an evaluation complete in order to meet the requirement to do that. Uh, they have until May 1st to complete um, evaluations by, by policy. And so there might be some folks in which their evaluation has been uh, delayed and therefore they wouldn't. The good news is if somebody were to call you panicking like my name is not on there, okay, then what would happen is each and every month from now to the beginning of the year, there's additional names that are brought forward to you catch everybody in an organization of 5,000 people. So we also, in the June board meetings, when we reappoint administrators and um, probationary annual teachers are reappointed at that point. Okay, so it's kind of a brief explanation of reappointment, the reappointment process. So you'll just see a big document with a bunch of names at some point, 200, 200 pages worth of stuff will be attached to it, and that's what that process is. Next, we have the ratification of the master contract between the FOP and, and uh, our school board police. We're happy to say that the contract was successful, and uh, they, meaning the members are voting this Thursday, I believe, and this is our portion of it. Okay. And congratulations to Miss to Miss Troutman. Now gets to bargain three contracts. <laughs> she was excited about that. Okay. Next, we have the appointment of the CCA and CESPA bargaining teams. You notice each year we bring the names forward of the people that are on the bargaining team for the board's approval. Of course, the superintendent, the chief finance officer are always members of, of the teams. Okay, next we have a proclamation for Teacher Appreciation Week, which, which is the 8th through the 12th of May, with Teacher Appreciation Day being May 9th. And I, I would just want to say for the record, Teacher Appreciation Day should be every day. Okay, but we're, we're giving special significance to May 9th. Okay? Next is Administrative Professionals Week, which is the 23rd to the 29th of April, with Administrative Professional Day being April 26th. 
was formerly known as Secretary's Day back in the back in the day. Back when we were back when we were at Middlebrook High together. I don't know if we were <laughs> Okay, elementary student out of, tra out of travel, uh, out of state travel. And then we have the, um, the secondary overnight student travel. And then we have the next two items are Florida Youth Challenge and PACE calendars. There'll be one other calendar that comes to the board, which is AMI. These would be all, these are schools within our district, within our purview that don't follow the normal calendar because they have an adjusted calendar such as uh, they have school during the summertime, for example, in those programs. And you'll see the AMI calendar next month. But essentially, that's why they're there. Next, we have an affiliation agreement between uh, FSCJ, and this is to have us, uh, occupational therapist interns at our school, so it's always good to recruit individuals that way. Next, we have Library Month, which is the month of April, proclamation. Then we have a proclamation for National Nurses Week, which is May 6th through 12th. I want to thank them for what they do. Next is the month of the military child is April, and Purple Up Day is April 19th. Ms. Fogarty's not here to, to whoop it up. But everybody should wear purple. I'll send a reminder out to support our military families on April 19th. Next is proposed allocation changes for 22-23. Uh, you can see the changes that are listed there. And then the changes for 23-24. A lot of times what happens when you have 5,000 folks, there's some, there's some cleanup that occurs uh, in the process, and that's what this document does. You would see that the actual changes save the district $118,000 in those changes. But it's things like uh, Lake Asbury Jr., we had the title of vice principal. We kind of phased out vice principal to assistant principal. And so there's only a couple of, quote, vice principals that are still out there. We kind of grandfathered that position out. So you can see the changes that are made there. Again, a total savings of $118,000 of general funds uh, for the district in this cleanup process. Remember, every month uh, we deal with allocations because we are an organization of 5,000 people. Next, we have the monthly financial reports. And then we have the budget uh, amendment report. Uh, how about this? We can certainly talk to this, Ms. Clark. Renewal of employee benefits. Uh, this is my 33rd or 34th year, and I've never seen where the amount of the cost of insurance actually goes down. Right? Has anybody ever seen insurance reduced? Really? Okay, I've never seen it. Uh, Only so, when going self-funded. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So a lot of a lot of celebrations when it comes to. Uh, employee benefits, you can see a, a, a flat rate for our health provider. We did have some challenges with our dental provider, and um, the committee went with United Healthcare Dental, had a cost savings of a quarter of a million dollars for the district, uh, as well as savings for Imana Vision. So, overall, a savings of well over um, a quarter of a million dollars in our um, employee benefits. Certainly, Ms. Clark serves on that committee, so it's a great celebration for, for our employees and our district. Next, we have the deletion of certain items report. Next, we have the bid renewal for uh, plumbing, flooring, water waste uh, treatment, as well as small scale construction. So you can see the, those bids there. Next is our pre qualification of contractors. Okay, several, several projects going on within the district. The first one is Ridgeview High School's roof repair for Building 2. Next is Bannerman Learning Center's um, parking lot renovation security lighting within Bannerman Learning Center. Next is a, a um, 
direct purchasing change order, which saves money for the district for Keystone Heights Elementary uh, classrooms and cafeteria. In other words, if we buy the, the products ourselves, we get to save the tax on that and saves the cost of the district. Okay, now we're heading into the fun part. Okay, there's six or seven items that all deal with when you open a new school, there has to be some adjustments to property, et cetera, related to it. So I'm gonna do my best to explain what that means in, in plain English. Uh, Lance Addison's here in case there are questions related to it. So the very first one deals with the opening of, of Spring Park Elementary School. And, and this is uh, a conveyance of 0.25 acres from Peters Creek Investments to the school district. So this is a, a strip of land in the front of the, where the school is that butts up against 315. And so one of the challenges is when that happens is that that strip is going to be used for other purposes such as easements for electrical, easements for uh, water, etc. And in order to make that all correct and all right, this strip is, is being uh, conveyed to us as the district. You know, in other words, they're giving us this strip of land. We're accepting this strip of land from them because we're going to go ahead and turn around later on and give it to the and give the same piece of land to the county so that the county can then put the um, the turn ins for for the school as well as the stacking of cars that has to occur for all of that. So this is pretty typical when uh, there's new construction. And you're gonna see that many of these items are related to this one item. There's three or four that are kind of connected to this. So this one basically says, hey, they're giving us a piece of land and we're accepting this piece of land. And it's the piece of land, it's the strip in front that borders from the front of the school to where the road begins, all right? So then the next one, what that does is it gives permission uh, creates a permanent easement so they can provide uh, water essentially to the new school. So it creates this permanent easement, which would include part of the piece of property mentioned in the first one. Okay, so that's Clay County uh, Utility Authority, the easement for that. The next one, same sort of theme, but it's for million dollars in our um, employee benefits. Certainly, Ms. Clark serves on that committee, so it's a great celebration for, for our employees and our district. Next, we have the deletion of certain items report. Next, we have the bid renewal for uh, plumbing, flooring, water waste uh, treatment, as well as small scale construction. And you can see the, those bids there. Next is our pre qualification of contractors. Okay, several, several projects going on within the district. The first one is Ridgeview High School's roof repair for Building 2. Next is Bannerman Learning Center's um, parking lot renovation security lighting within Bannerman Learning Center. Next is a, a um, direct person change order which saves money for the district for Keystone Heights Elementary um, classrooms and cafeteria. In other words, if we buy the, the products ourselves, we get to save the tax on that and saves the cost of the district. Okay, now we're heading into the fun part. Okay, there's six or seven items that all deal with when you open a new school, there has to be some adjustments to property, et cetera, related to it. So I'm gonna do my best to explain what that means in, in plain English. Uh, Lance Addison's here in case there are questions related to it. So the very first one deals with the opening of, of Spring Park Elementary School. And, and this is uh, a conveyance of 0.25 acres from Peters Creek Investments to the school district. So this is a, a strip of land in the front of the, where the school is that butts up against 315. 
And so one of the challenges is when that happens is that that strip is going to be used for other purposes, such as easements for electrical, easements for uh, water, et cetera. And in order to make that all correct and all right, this strip is, is being uh, conveyed to us as the district. You know, in other words, they're giving us this strip of land. We're accepting this strip of land from them because we're going to go ahead and turn around later on and give it to the and give the same piece of land to the county so that the county can then put the um, the turn ins for for the school as well as the stacking of the cars that has to occur for all of that. So this is pretty typical when uh, there's new construction. And you're going to see that many of these items are related to this one item. There's three or four that are kind of connected to this. So this one basically says Hey, they're giving us a piece of land and we're accepting this piece of land. And it's the piece of land, it's the strip in front that borders from the front of the school to where the road begins. All right? So then the next one, what that does is it gives permission, uh, creates a permanent easement so they can provide uh, water, essentially, to the new school. So it creates this permanent easement which would include part of the piece of property mentioned in the first one, okay? So that's Clay County uh, Utility Authority, the easement for that. The next one, same sort of theme, but it's for electricity, for uh, Clay Electric. They have the same thing, the access and easement related to Spring Park Elementary. Then the next one is a, a temporary construction easement. Uh, this is granting temporary construction easement to the county because what has to happen is you can't say to the county, hey, you're doing this work, but we're not gonna let you step foot onto our property. There has to be an easement for them to do the work that they need to do in order for us to have the school ready to go in, uh, in August. Next is an interlocal agreement between the district and the county uh, for the building of a right-of-way that explains the expenses and responsibilities uh, for both parties. So basically, anything that's contiguous to the school is paid for by the district. In other words, anything that touches our land. And then anything that's not contiguous to the school is then paid for by the, by the county, whether it's sidewalks, et cetera, that kind of, that kind of thing. Next is totally different topic. So all of those are kind of related, right? You can see how they're all related, the conveyance of a piece of property, we need to have an easement for electric, for, for water, etc. This this next couple deals with uh, Lake Asbury Elementary, Lake Asbury Junior High. This is the conveyance of 0.75 acres. Um, and basically uh, they're going to be expanding the road right there in front. And what's going to happen is uh, there's going to be additional sidewalks for student safety in that area, which is a really good thing in that area. There will also be some adjustments to the current uh, retention pond that's in front of there. There's also a retention pond that goes along um, the property line of it. So the reworking of this would take away the retention pond that goes along the side of the property. It would expand slightly the, the size of the retention pond that's in the front now. Uh, as you expand the road, then the need to have more places for water to go is, is part of the getting, and so that's part of what this is uh, talking about. Is this uh, Sandridge or is this Henley? Sandridge. 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 Sandridge, right up to the to the intersection at Henley. Okay. Uh, next is a license agreement with Clay County for Lake Asbury for their improvements. This, this allows them to come onto our property to ensure harmonization of the project. So for example, if they're regrading the road and our property starts right here, you don't want to say to them, you can only go to our property. Because right, when you're grading the road, you're going to have to come onto our property to ensure 
proper grading and what we're calling or referring to as harmonization, right? You just don't want them to stop physically right at the line. That has to be, that is going to have to go onto our property to do some of the work. And that's what this allows them to do. It, Mr. Broski, is it just sidewalks? Or is there going to be... They're going to, they're going the to, road, right? They're expanding the road, yes ma'am. Is it to four lanes or like a turn lane to get there's, in and out? There's turn lanes and... An extra lane. Yes. Yes. So they, say the same last part. An extra lane and a turn lane. An extra, extra lane and a turn lane. Is it an extra lane both ways? Uh, I have to look at the, at the um, I can't remember if it's on the going uh, westbound, but I know going yeah. eastbound. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe not the side that's... Good. Oh, the side of Wendy's. Right, on the Wendy's side, I don't think there is an extra lane. Right. All right. There's a map. Okay. Yeah. okay, and the last one's temporary construction easement to Clay County to this, for that same work. Okay, so you gotta, you gotta give me temporary easement. So all of those are all related to two projects, one being Spring Park Elementary, one being um, Lake Asbury Elementary, Lake Asbury Junior High, because those two schools are so close. Mr. will those be during the school year? No. no. They're, they're, not, they're starting the summer. Okay, so we're not now, worried about kids walking to and from school through construction? Now, some of that um, retention pond work is about to begin if it and maybe some of the clay county property that they own i believe they've begun some of that work but actually blocking off the roads and all that they haven't started that yet they're required to maintain safe walking conditions okay so if, it, if it does overlap any will the students families be notified i just know there's a lot of kids that bike and walk by themselves in that area is, is there a way that we can let we can get with the we can get with the school and push something out just to make sure parents are aware sure. that there's going to be a change to the traffic pattern yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Matt, can i ask for a quick if the speaking of sidewalks i think we talked about it before but i assume spring park will have one out front do we know yes because I know there's going to be a lot from Willow Springs when we go across that. I mean, I'd love to see the flashing. It's on the Willow Springs side. Okay. Actually, in front to of walk, the school. So there there, is there's none in front of the school. Um, to walk down to the signal. Right. Okay. But on the other side of 315, there will be the Willow Springs area that there will be some. Okay. I think um, most parents can see what's going on around the neighborhoods, but. Yeah. I just, you know, as a responsible party in charge of those kids, I want to make sure we do everything we can to make sure parents know changes, changes and yeah. Sure. Can make it What's the approximate time to completion in front of Lake Asbury where they're fixing the lanes? You said it would start in the summer. It would start in the summer. They're supposed to be complete in the summer. Mm -hmm. But we'll, as it goes along, we'll, we'll get more information on any delays or... The goal would be prior to the start of school, so to, yeah. to minimize... They are trying to get... Minimize to disruption. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. people there every day, that's what I was wondering. Are they trying to get it done before? Yes. Trust me, they want to minimize disruptions yeah, to the do. school process. Is there a good county that's doing it? Mm -hmm. The actual county? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is, that's part of the bonded transportation program, mm -hmm. so that's who's building that area right there. Mm -hmm. It's been, been in works for years, I mean, as far as the planning portion of this. And the, and the last one is, is uh, for Shadowlawn Elementary, and basically there's a road that would go from Shadow Elementary, uh, where Shadowlawn Elementary, where the light is, would continue to go straight, straight through. This is the conveyance of the property to ensure that that occurs. It's been a long time agreement. Now that work is going to be done this summer, and their plan is to do the same thing, which is to have it complete during the summertime to minimize disruption to the school. I do have one additional topic. If you can kind of put those two photos up, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. One additional thing just for the board's consideration is we had a request for the purchase of property. Uh, that we own, and this you're looking at um, Montclair Elementary, the very back of Montclair. There's a little piece of that that's about a quarter acre, uh, and if you can look in front of that, maybe you can use your cursor, Bonnie, to show the fence line of it. Is that right? No, it's back a little bit further. Back. Way back. So. Okay. So there's a fence line right here right there 
And um, this is Montclair, this is the back of Montclair. There's a little quarter of an acre right here, and um, it's all fenced off. And the property owner back behind the school would, would, has requested, pending the, the approval of the board, whether you're interested or not, if we can, if he can buy this quarter of an acre from us. <laughs> And so, really, when I look at this, my, my, my thought process is it's behind the fence of what we actually have. So it really doesn't, it's not being used by us at all. So, why do we have it? Because uh, it was just part of the original property. Part of the original okay. property. And, and so, clean cut it. And we kind of clean cut it's it never been used right? off there, yeah. so it's not being Correct. used. So, the reason why we bring this forward is to gain a little bit of consensus, why we can't vote at a um, board workshop before you go through the process of an appraisal and all of that kind of stuff. We wanted to know if the board had any objection uh, towards selling that one piece behind the fence. Is that a at, sidewalk? At Montclair. It goes into the neighborhood behind. Okay. Should be not. There's not one sidewalk. on each side that goes into Village Green. Yeah. There are two. Would it impact the kids on the sidewalk going out to No, the it's between those two houses. So the blue area. Only the blue area. The rectangle. Yes. Or the, is it the odd shaped section? Is it just the blue part? No, it's, it's the blue just area. The, the blue area. rectangle okay. area. I'm not, so I'm sorry, not the rectangle area, but that polygon okay. area right here. Way to go, Matt. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> And the, this, the precedent, the precedent has been set before. I mean, we've had, you know, there's been a request, and this, we have no f future use for that property. So we did it at Montclair. Another yeah. his neighbor, I guess they started talking. We also did it with that little strip and that went to Blanding Boulevard that separated. It was, used to be a, a, another access that might have been used, but I think in 20, 19 or twenty. We did that one, but. But he's gonna be okay with like kids cutting through there, like with that sidewalk and stuff. It's already, it already does it now. He's okay. just, that's his backyard, so he's okay. just wanting up. to move the fence back a little bit further. And like Lance said, it's behind our fence, so we don't even maintain that area. It's our property, but we fenced it off, and we don't maintain it. It reduces our liability. It reduces our maintenance. So Less if we're not using here, exactly. Okay, so it does. Sounds like there's consensus. Five million dollars. I'm on two so we can't really know what we want. Okay. All right, so we're good. So we're good there. So now we're up to the discussion part of the agenda. Right now, there's no special actions at, at this point uh, for this particular meeting. The first one is the public hearing related to the adoption of the K-5 math and 612 social studies um, adoption. Remember, this was already advertised. We've waited the 28 days. Now it's the public hearing for those materials. The next one is the public hearing related to the, advertise, the advertised amendments to the manual for library and media services, as well as the manual for instructional resources. So again, we did the advertising previously. We waited the 28 days that we're required to wait. Now this will be a public hearing for the adoption of that, of that policy. Next, we have the public hearing to approve the amendments to the school board policy 6.01. This is the annual architect engineering selection. Remember this put the policy in line with the statute related to the amount um, of the amount or cost of a project to be in line with what the state statute said. Then the last one is not really a discussion item, but it was moved to discussion to this particular spot because you would have to approve the, the, the policy first mm -hmm. before we could take the action on the last item. So the order of this is very important. So it wasn't moved to discussion for some sort of reason like we wanted a great discussion. It was moved, <laughs> it was moved there because you have to approve the policy first before we can take action on the policy. Right? So it's kind of the, although a, a great discussion is always appreciated, right? But I'm just pointing that out. So this is the architectural services up to $4 million. Ms. Hansen sat on this this particular committee and, and lists 
all of the architectural firms involved in that in that process. And really, what happened is, you know, the cost of projects is, is so high that our minimum was so low, it wasn't even in compliance with the state. And so that's kind of the reason why those are there. So, any questions on any of the agenda items? Okay, so then let's move right into the the, uh, the code of conduct. So the code of conduct is a group of, of really about 20 people. We've asked uh, Mr. Jones, Justin Jones, which you see over there, as well as Kevin Stacy, who are our hearing officers, officers that you, you see every board board meeting. They lead that work. That group meets. They go through the whole code of conduct, which is a big long document. In discussion with the board, and just in our interactions, there seem to be three different areas of interest related to the code of conduct. There's all kinds of stuff, and the whole code of conduct will be brought back to you in future months. But because this committee is working on it, and they have nine subgroups, nine task force made up of the people that are in this committee, it's important for the board to recognize the big picture of what's happening with the code of conduct uh, in preparation. Our goal would be to advertise it, to have the public hearing and have it improved in enough time for administrators to go through training this summer and then informing our parents when we come back to school in August. So we're to the point now where if there's any additional input related to these topics, then you know, now would be the time to tell us, right, in the process. So it seemed like through discussion, wireless communication, i.e. cell phones, was one of those topics as well as um, dress code as well as uh, uh, restrooms. So that's what we're going to do now, is just have a, a conversation related to it. Let's start off with cell phones, wireless communication devices. When we're, when we're done, Mr. Broski, sure. if I had a couple of other questions sure. at the end, we can discuss that. Sure. Then. Yeah, or about the code of conduct or about... Yeah, code of conduct. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about uh, wireless communication devices. There's no doubt that communication devices are a part of, of everyone's life. You know, whether we like that or not, uh, I can remember when, when uh, I had I put off getting my own children cell phones and refused to text, by the way. I was an anti-texter. I said, hey, I'm going to text you, Dad. I said, you will not. You will call me on the phone because that's what real adults do. We talk to one another. We don't like text. Right? And all that stuff. So I was very much a lot of pushback. But I also have to say, oh, my, there's not a person in this room right now that doesn't have a cell phone on them. Right. The integration of, of the technology into our lives is definitely there whether we like that or not. So then the issue of how to manage that at school becomes a, a challenge. Right? We don't want to interrupt the learning environment uh, for students. And so you'll take a look at this policy and it puts some additional restrictions on, on it such as the um, and just the simple recording, audio recordings, right? You know that Florida is a two-party state in which you don't just, just record somebody against their knowledge or without their knowledge, right? So we added that portion of it. We also added a portion about uh, the recording of, of fights and similar events to post them on social media. We felt like that was a, uh, the, the group, the Code of Conduct Committee, felt like that was important because you see that prolifically in society. We also basically said, hey, these electronic devices should be silenced or powered off and out of sight once you enter the classroom. So from bell to bell in a class, it should be filled with engaging instruction. It shouldn't be using a cell phone during that time frame. Uh, it also kind of put the on, on notice, a common sense thing would be the use of, of cell phones within areas of personal space, such as bathrooms, locker rooms, etc. And of course, one of the challenges there is that people are concerned about the recording or the videotaping or whatever in a restroom facility. Um, and then it says students may not use wireless communication devices to accept or make phone calls 
or video conferencing during school hours. In other words, students t taking video uh, and then sending it or being on a conference call, uh, FaceTime, for example, during school hours because of the disruptive nature of that in the school environment. Uh, and it does, it does, it does not, this policy does not um, prevent students from using it in transition or during lunchtime. So the, so the issue becomes where do you draw the line? Clearly the committee felt like you draw the line when it's instructional time, it's instructional time, uh, and then we recognize that these things are occurring in society outside of that time. So with that in mind, uh, I'll open the floor for discussion. Who wants to start? Me too. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading here where it states um, you can use your cell phone if there is not, am I reading this right, if there is no other technology available? Is that what that says? What is this? Oh, yes. trying to, during instructional time for educational purposes when uh, when no school issued technology is available. And it's sanctioned by the classroom teacher. So I got a question. Do they not all get Chromebooks? Uh, in fact, most students would have the accessibility towards that, but we didn't want to put in the policy uh, an definitive no, just in case there was a student that didn't have access to it. Not every school has one-to-one -one devices. It's close. Do it on the computer lab. I'm just trying to make it fair for all students, because not every student has a cell phone. You know what I mean? So like if a, right. if a teacher is so, like, okay, we don't have Chromebooks and we can't go to a computer lab, um, everybody pull out your cell phone and I want you to look this up. I would say that the, the odds of there being no technology for students are very, 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 very slim. I think what we try to do in the policy was not totally ban it in case the teacher wanted to have them use a cell phone. And then in that case, you would then have the availability of perhaps students on their cell phone for a uh, uh, for a particular, a lot of times they use the survey, the um, a surveying device, mm -hmm. like, a, like a Kahoot that you saw at the, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Now, just trying to make it, the very there are more and more parents that are taking cell phones, and more and more parents who are not allowing. I believe that I believe that they would have access to an electronic device mm -hmm. if they didn't have a cell phone that can be arranged. My concern, um, it's a, it is a, in line with what you're saying about there being that have and have not feeling between students where it becomes, well, I've got this iPhone, you've got that flip phone or whatever, they, you know, it becomes a comparison, a distraction. But more than that, it's so, um, it's such a battle with students that if there is a discrepancy between, a teach, between teachers of how they manage cell phones in their classrooms, um, if the rule isn't held up in one classroom, but it is in the other, there's a bit of an undermining that happens there. We, we, we could, if the board wants to move in that direction, uh, basically say that there's no use of the cell phone you know, regardless. That's what I'm more comfortable with. I think it's there's no reason for it to be out in the classroom when we have access across the board to district control devices that are equitable for every person in the classroom and they have all of the blockers and software that keeps kids off of things that they ought not be accessing during the school day. And they don't have, I don't think, access to the camera on the computer to be taking pictures or whatever else might be happening in the classroom. Nope. And again, I think the fear would be that once you, and there was discussion about this very, mm -hmm. very topic, I'm which, sure. which is once you, once you, uh, then put it in the hands, maybe some people un unwittingly would allow that and then create that discrepancy. Correct. That in there. Correct. At the same time, we didn't want to restrict access if it truly was an academic endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are ways to accomplish that without using a cell phone. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, did you have anything else to say? Yeah, I, I have something. Uh, yeah, okay. I just, and then. My only other concern was um, 
don't know how. Mm. And this would, I guess, be open for discussion as, as lunch breaks and transition between classes. That's normally when people text to, to meet up to fight. You know what I mean? They text to, to meet up. I get, like, sometimes you're like, hey, mom, can you bring me my lunch? Hey, mom, can you, you know, I get that. Um, but I also understand um, this is also the time where something has happened in the classroom and that now they want to rally up a, a whatever. Um, or I just, idle hands are a double workshop, is what I think in my mind. And um, I don't know, that would be up to all of you to. I'm a Betty Green when it comes to cell phones. I'll Jesus. admit that. I'm with you. I told my kids, you'll never have one. It's all I, have, I have a cell phone that you have to press, but you have to press it three times. Yeah. You have to press it three times. 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 You have to press
there has got to be a way to not only be consistent about it, but make sure they're off and in a backpack. And we as adults need to figure out how we can be consistent and be serious. I believe if we involve parents, we disseminate information about the health hazards of cell phones and how it distracts our kids from academic learning, that we can get our community on board. But at some point, although it looks good on paper, I feel like we have a real problem and a real challenge. And I'm not sure if we can discuss that. Of course we can. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, mean, I, I just need to feel. So in regards to policy, what is the wording in the policy that you'd like to see changed and perhaps we should hear from, from uh, Mr. Jones who, who led the discussion of, of um, teachers, administrators, parents on the committee as to what their thoughts were as to why it came to this conclusion that we're bringing here today. So I don't know if you want to yeah. start off. And Just to provide a little bit of historical context, there was a large revamping that was done on our current code of conduct and handbook uh, right around 2019. And one of the things that was we were seeing throughout the country at the time was this notion of bring your own device. It's, it's hard to, to remember and realize that really as recently as 2016, 17, the number of Chromebooks and, and devices that we had for students to access on campus was quite minimal. And so in the course of four or five years, there's been a, a very large advancement in the rollout of technology. And so back in 19, what we did was implemented a bring your own device policy with the notion being, and of course you'll remember this, that in a, in a perfect world, in a perfect classroom environment, students would have the opportunity to utilize their device uh, for academic exercises and academic activities in the classroom. And so since that time, of course, we've rolled out in many schools, I would say, and this is just, I'm throwing this number out there based on what I've seen, um, although we are not completely one-to-one -one at every school, many schools in fact are, and most schools that are not are probably well above 90%. So there's a tremendous amount of access to technology now. So one of the things that as a committee we did was we felt we were actually taking a very large uh, step in the, and certainly in the right direction, but a retraction back of using your own devices. And you'll note, notice at the very top of the page, we're not even we're not even dealing with a bring your own device policy. The goal being that students would not would not need to or be compelled to utilize their own technology in the classroom for all the reasons that were mentioned here today. You know, that's not a device that we monitor. We don't know what the kid is bringing into the classroom. We want them to use Clay County School District devices. And so we're actually making a big retraction, or that was the notion. And, and when doing that, you know, that's something over time, I think, that we felt like we were doing in a very scaled back way. But this is a pretty big step. Again, not to say step backwards, but a uh, sort of a restriction, if you will, on utilizing your own devices when compared to what we were doing just really a few years ago. So well, I think it's using them everywhere. Lunchroom, transition. Oh, they're not developing any social skills. They've got their face in a phone even at school. I mean, we're we're scaling it back, but we're really not unless we make a stand about I mean, some schools have the kids put the cell phones in their backpacks. Mm -hmm. And the principals are very serious about that. And it's actually the the, the community has become custom to that. But it's I'm in favor of making that the rule is consistent across the board. I and I was years ago, we had this discussion as a board. I, I think just, that this policy does that and uh, perhaps discuss this year versus previous year because there's been movement this year relative to this. We covered this over our training over the summertime. You will see just about uh, every school when they're communicating out to parents is also communicating out the cell phone policy, which is for the cell phone to go out. So we've seen the improvement this year relative to it. This locks it down more for in-classroom, the in-classroom time frame. What I hear is kind of like the sticking foot. I think we all agree on that portion of it, right? Well, the class. silence part. Now we expect kids to remember how to turn it on and off, and I can barely do that when I come in here. So, We're going to turn it on during hallway time. We're going to turn it off. Um, I just really cannot understand why a kid needs their cell phone on all day long. I just, 
I'm not, I cannot wrap my head around that. Parents do yeah. kids quite a bit as well. Why don't we let uh, Mr. Daly go ahead? This is your. Well, interestingly enough, good morning. Um, interestingly enough, I just led a focus group with principals on this very topic, and there's a to, to kind of give you the the um, bullet points version of that conversation. Distinct difference between how elementary principals see this issue and how secondary principals mm -hmm. see this issue. As a parent of three children, these things was that cell phones aren't going away. They're part of the landscape. They're part of the fabric of society. I didn't grow up with them, and you here did not grow up with them. And so we didn't we didn't learn as children the etiquette, right? We have to produce our own etiquette relative to this issue. Uh, I think suppressing it, you're going to have significant pushback from secondary leaders and from parents. Uh, parents at school, or hey, we're, I'm not going to be there, you're going to have to put dinner on, or whatever those things were. They could do it during that window of time and not distract them doing it throughout the day, which I promise you does occur if that strategy isn't put into place. And so, and I'm guilty of it as well with my own children because we have a lot of moving parts in our family, like a lot of working families. And we're trying to make it all work and things change and evolve throughout the day. It's not possible for us to, for me, to like call Dustin James at Lakeside every single time I've got a challenge. So I know when my son's lunchtime is and I hit him up there, I try to hit him up before you know, he gets to the bus, those types of things. So what, what I hear from the communities of people working in the schools, we recognize that cell phones are a distraction in the academic environment. Around that, I think there's little debate, to me, no question. But how do we allow to like sort of, sort of learn to live with um, this technology in a way that's fruitful and productive and not draconian and still pragmatic and manageable, right? Because that's the that's the idea. We don't have an infinite number of resources around which we can do this. Because what would happen, to in my experience, is we would have students who are A plus jam up kids who are getting in trouble only for cell phones. That was they were becoming criminalized because of cell phones, not an academic issue, not any other behavioral issue because of that. They were accruing <coughs> disciplinary records based on the cell phone when they were texting their mother. Yeah. And that to me that seemed ridiculous and I wanted to address it. And I felt like we did a very, very good job where it was no longer a distraction. At, at, at most a minimal distraction. But that's a classroom <laughs> management piece for teachers not an administrative oversight piece, in my opinion. So, you know, I think if you talk to any administrator, any administrator at the secondary level, they'll say it's different. Now, if, if Mrs. Tito or, or Dr. Sanders want to weigh in, elementary is quite different. I heard very strongly from the elementary principals it's much more manageable to have it com completely. I guess they just don't have them as much. You, I'll defer to you on that. You were involved in so it isn't it isn't the same kind of concern or issue because the students are staying most of the time in self-contained classrooms all day or teaming. So basically, it usually stays in their backpack, powered off. That's usually the, the policy and procedure. So that was not an issue as a principal that I really counteracted too often. Our rule as well when I was a principal was cell phone if it has to come to school because many parents do want them to have it for um, safety reasons then it is powered off in the backpack it cannot be powered back on until you leave the gates at the school mm -hmm. um, if they were we, we didn't have issue with this um, if they were if it was caught ringing or a student you know it was out then it was just you know turned off put back in the backpack and then the teacher would handle that as a um, call home, talk to the family about it, and there would be some type of, you know, consequence as part of this, the made of the system of the classroom. But yeah, it didn't take a lot of my time in elementary school. And I was at a pretty large, we were both at a pretty large elementary. It's just different secondary for, 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 I think, obvious reasons. I just ask the board to always consider when you're asking for administrators to do one other thing, what are we taking away so that they can do this one other thing if it's prioritized? Because they can't do everything. There's just not enough of them. There's not enough of them to do what they need to do right now. And so my rule always, for my, myself personally in this role, is what am I taking off the plate before I put something on the plate of my other people who serve me well? Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's what we heard from the focus group. But if you have any other questions, I'm, I'm I do have a question. Where are the days where, um, because, I mean, I don't, I mean, I guess calculus is it, in my head now. It was quite some time, but I didn't graduate that long. 
Okay. That That's long not ago. Rub it in. Yeah. Like, I'm not gonna I'm do the math. I'm starting to, but anyways, I mean, if my mom needed to get a hold of me, she would call the front office, mm -hmm. especially at a high school. And do we not have office aides? Is that on the class period anymore? You can certainly do that, but I think what Mr. Gander is trying to point out. But, is but hold on, hold on. This is my point, though. My mom didn't call the the office to be like, "Hey, make sure you you unthaw the chicken when you got home." For <laughs> well, me what, what, I mean? I, what, what I would say to you is that it's just it would I, be unnecessary communication until okay, at two forty two I get out of, or one forty two I get out of school. My mom should call me and be like. Hey, by the way, I thought that chicken. Hurt. My, my my response to that is that communication and the expectation of communication that's quick and clear and always available has evolved in many aspects societally. Right. And I think with parents especially, that I, I think you're going to find out what parents think about this issue if, if you go forward. And we're not saying problems. you can't have yourself on no, the No, I, 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 I think we've gone off track. Available. Yeah, it will be available. It's, it's in their backpack listen, available. Sometimes, and I'm not saying everybody, but I mean sometimes your text can be a distraction because it was just unnecessary for you to text that. You I know think, what I mean? Or how somebody, about in transition in a closed hallway, everybody's on their cell phone, slowing down. And it makes it to where kids aren't looking up from their from their lunch plate and communicating with their friends. People are no longer. I, I urge you to, to go and sit through a, a, a senior high lunch. Well, I am. Um, like, like, or one without cell phones because those don't exist anymore. But the ones with a very different scene. It doesn't you know, mean it's chaotic, right. Difficult to manage. Uh, the other, like, and almost because we worked this out with our teachers, and we went from. But how do we Chaos manage that? That's to, what I'm saying. To, how do you yeah. manage that with our cell We used to we manage it without cell phones. Right. Before, I wasn't allowed to have a cell phone. Well, then I stand school. ready to work you know with I mean? professional mm -hmm. learning. And guess what? You know who my administrator <laughs> staff was? These in the, well, yeah. Ms. Uh, Chapman left. But there was a, a group of uh, four of you. And <clears> I think, I think I times were, <laughs> I know you want to think it was a couple years ago. <laughs> But, like but yeah, it really has evolved, <laughs> and of course, I, I will tell you that uh, even during my last principalship, I had a, a stricter policy related to cell phones. That doesn't mean that I don't recognize where we are societally, and I think that parents uh, really are, are wanting the availability to their students. And the question is, I don't think you could do the office things, because I'm sure the dailies communicate with their, their two children in the system, the third one's in college now, every day about when soccer practice is and when it's moved, and when the game is, and did you bring this, and did you do that, and all those kinds of things. Well, you can text or leave a voicemail all day long, and then at the end of the day, the cell phone comes on and they get every message that you left for them. I don't yeah. see why that's really an issue. I don't, because the kid's not going to do anything about it at 11 o'clock in the morning when they're in class. Yeah. All, all I'm saying is this cultural shift, I get what you're saying, um, it's not good for our kids. It's may, not. May and something? we basically are giving up. Oh, it's just too hard to manage. Or we, I don't communicate like I used to, where, am I, where I know where to be at the right time. Every teacher has a phone in their classroom. So I'll leave it at this because I'm just, I've said my piece. But basically, every time society changes and culture changes, if we know something is bad for kids, and we know it affects them, their mental health and their academic performance, and it's only six hours a day, and our best solution is they just need to have it, then I guess that's our best solution. I have a problem with it in transition. Um, one, because you need to get to class on time. That's a real problem for me. I do not have a problem, Mr. Daly, with it being used at lunch, where you could communicate to your son at lunch every day. I have a problem with, we have sixth grade in elementary school. That's a whole different class of kids sneaking around on their cell phones wherever they can. So, in the event that there's cultural shifts, whether it's good for our kids or not, I just want to go on record by saying, sometimes when things are hard, they're hard for a reason. And that if the cultural shift went this way, I wish we could change it back where education becomes more important than the ease of keeping a cell phone.
Because that's my last I say. Why do they need it on that three minute period? Uh, what are you going to do? Text your friend the answers to the test? I mean, I think the question, and I, this was something that I noted mm -hmm. when I looked through the draft of the policy, um, the discipline for it is not spelled out. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that it would not be spelled out in the policy, obviously, is because it's being addressed only in the classroom. So it would be at the purview of that teacher. Um, to escalate the discipline if necessary, depending on if I tell you to put the phone away and you comply, that we may leave it there. But if you continue to rebel, and that becomes defiance and you would escalate the discipline from that point. So I get why you wouldn't put it in this policy. But I think to Mr. Daly's point, how are you going to discipline? What will be the enforcement piece? Because that, has, that does have to be spelled out in policy if it's mm -hmm. something that's outside of the classroom. So how about well, however don't. many times then you get your phone taken away and your parent has to come get it? Because well, then the parent now has to leave wherever they're at and or... I mean, we used to take it away and they stopped using it. <laughs> they just, oh, I'm not going to get my phone taken away. <laughs> right. But the parent then has to go up to the school. And at, I'm going to tell you right now, if it was my child, I'd be like, you pull out your cell phone again and I have to come up here and get it? You're not getting it anymore. I mean, I know I parent differently. However, you've inconvenienced me as a parent now. And that's, now the, that's the I'm, policy at my kid's school, right? It's and a K-12. We have high school students there, and the policy is if I see it, I take it. The administration, if they see it, they take it. And then the parent has to come retrieve the phone at the end of the day. So, like, I, I don't disagree with you on that, but when I compare what I've seen in enforcement of this policy, the number of students is much smaller than at a high school where you have 2,000 ninth through 12th grade students all with cell phones. So that that's the portion of it and the ratio of an administrator to that number of students policing that in the hallway and in the cafeteria. That, that enforcement piece is very different. And if you're not consistent across the board with every child, then you run into an even bigger issue of, well, why are you picking on my kid? That kid has their phone every day and they get away with it. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the removal of the child. You can remove the child from that school or that setting, and uh, the other schools in the system cannot mm -hmm. except they remove the child from the school. If I can uh, clarify a few things, um, first off, on the page that you're looking at right there, you'll see that it was elementary, mm -hmm. and then on the next page it was secondary. Yeah. All right, now it's all students, and then secondary only. So the transition in the cafeteria is only for secondary students. It's not mm -hmm. for elementary. So what so, if what if we bump that to high school only? Yeah, and not, junior, not high. junior high. Um, I, we can talk about that with the junior high principals, uh, and I'm not sure if Roger has any input on that with the junior high principal versus the, the high school principal. Because at that point, they're not driving. They're not, I mean, there are sports, uh, but the majority of them are staying after school for that sport, right? You're not having the enforcement portion of it. Sure. Your ratio, the number of students at a junior high is smaller than at a high school. You may, I don't know what the ratios are, administration to student. Is it different, Mr. Brosky? There would high. be junior highs that would have three, mm -hmm. potentially four administrators staying on the side of the school. Right. Like Asbury, pretty big. Like Asbury Junior High is very big. Oh, yeah. 
and Oak Leaf Junior High is big as well. The other thing, if I can also say, is one of the things that we, um, I want to say it's about five or six years ago, um, there was an actual cell phone violation that was listed uh, when students would get in trouble for cell phones. That violation, for whatever reason, at that particular time, was taken out of uh, circulation. So the other thing that's been put into the code of conduct this year is there is now a clear wireless communication device violation. So what's been happening up to this point, at least for the last few years with Synergy, is uh, administrators have been coding it depending on the school in different ways. Some of them it's been done as a violation of classroom rules. Others, it's been inappropriate conduct. Other, that it's been possession of an inappropriate object. So one of the things that we also tried to do this year by putting that code back in was to actually track the number of violations. So we would have a much clearer statistic to address what's actually going on uh, moving forward. So I, what I'm hearing you say, that, and what we mentioned before, this is a bear. I mean, this is something that, um, you know, you let enough leash loose, pulling it back in is going to be a battle. Mm -hmm. And so I think, to, I, get that, I get that method too, however, we're also dealing with a lot of other issues besides just this one. So I see, from your perspective, this is a step um, in a direction, and I love the idea of being able to track this more efficiently. Um, and make adjustments as we move forward in following years. That this is a, um, if you can look at it as a fluid document. And I, you know, here's another point that I just thought of. We get so frustrated all the time with unfunded mandates from Tallahassee, right? Mm -hmm. How is this any different? We're now making a new mandate, but we're not giving you any new personnel to help you address this mandate. I mean, I think about the library book issue and what a phenomenal job our staff has done with that, but how how much of a heavy lift that was for them when there's no additional support for it. So I think that as a board, to responsibly change policy in a way that is so drastic and so um, countercultural, that it, it really is going to require a very strategic, methodical approach so that our staff doesn't feel overburdened and unsupported, and so that our our students and our parents understand the direction we're moving in. But we, we are changing and amending the fact that it can't be used at all during classes, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And so my question also, of Doc, would, if we were to, you know, sell that piece of property or something like that, would we be able to uh, purchase more Chromebooks so that we have 100% one-on-one? -on -one? Why don't you address where we are one-on-one? Um, that's actually a, an interesting question. Um, if you actually look at the number of students we have and the number of Chromebooks that we have, we are at one-to-one. -one. However, because you have classroom sets and they are not assigned to individual students, mm -hmm. then you have a discrepancy if you have a class where maybe in their first period class they have 30, stu there's 30 students in the class. They move on to their second period class and there are 12 students in class. Of course, you have to have 30 Chromebooks for both of those, okay. even though the class size. So you might smaller. go next door and use the teachers next door. That's what you do in secondary yeah. school. Or you just have yeah. a yeah. test. Like, can okay. I borrow your phone? So that's what I was. Yeah. I was wondering. So if we're we're essentially at one to one, then yeah. this shouldn't be. Any it's problem. not hard. No, no, the technology piece will be a problem. Okay. Well, I like what has been done here as far as the changes. There are schools that do not allow cell phones. Believe it or not. Yeah. Um, my biggest issue is, besides the books, mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, we're back to that. We've got a lot of students with suicidal tendencies. Yeah. And we know that the cell phone is a majority of the culprit. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned we only have a student 14% of the time. You know, I, I would like to see the top line under all students, students may have electronic devices on school property, but in their backpacks. And here's, and a, here's another thought. Secondary, you know, that's separate, and we do have to do something different. I, I would like to see them socializing and talking, mm -hmm. because they don't have those skills when they get to employment. Yep. 
and you know we want to coddle them and give in, but I could see, as has been mentioned, if that cell phone gets given to an assistant principal or a principal, and the parent has to come get that cell phone. And it, yes, it will be a nightmare. Um, it actually wasn't because people knew what was going to happen. It was like you got rid of the gray area. And so if one, you took one child's cell phone, called the parent and made him pick it up, you didn't have another problem for weeks in that class because no one wanted their cell phone taken away. But, it but was really the seriousness. It's all about the mental health yeah. side of it. And, and we continue to have disciplinary problems. And yet we say we have them, but what are we going to do to address them? So um, I, I like what we've done here, but you know, I just have to yeah. have real concerns. I think, like, I think what I'm hearing is that we all feel like we need to do more, um, but I do think this is a good starting point, and I think we need to think about, um, I think things like every year, at least once a year, there needs to be a some sort of communication, whether it's a meeting or a note home with, with a student that talks about appropriate use of electronic devices and the problems that we're seeing with it from a school district perspective, because a parent doesn't see things from a school district perspective. So I think um, there's a, a portion of community education that we're responsible for as we, like I said, start to make a shift in something that's a cultural norm. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's going to take training our staff into how, how do we address this. I know um, at my school where I work, the grade level um, chooses a staff member for each day of the week to have lunch with that grade level. So the adult, there's an adult with every grade level, a teacher with every grade level, and we're sitting with them, having conversation, monitoring their conversation. With kindergarten, you're opening ketchup packets. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, I, all the way up through, right now, my job, I supervise um, seventh and eighth grade during their lunch, and, and they have a little bit of a free time, free period. Um, but it's that, like you said, there's such a disconnect relationally when we have devices um, as accessible as they are, not just at school, but at home, <laughs> you know, at the dinner table. And we've all in experienced that interruption of family time at the dinner table because of mom or dad's cell phone or some kid's cell phone. Um, but I think it's a there's a retraining that has to happen, and it's the adults that have to do that. So um, I'm not allowed to have. Myself. I mean, when they graduate, they go to work and be retrained. It's a rule in the house. Well, and that's the thing. This is also an adult problem. This, is, this isn't just a you know, kid problem. This is a teacher problem. This is an administrator problem. This is a uh, everybody problem. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, mod it's modeling problem. that behavior for yeah. your students. I know, like I said, where I work, my cell phone stays yeah. away. I mean, I've seen teachers on cell phones phone. in the hallway, so mm -hmm. yeah. it's we don't even model. Um, some people do, some people don't. It is it is a real problem. Yeah. So, so how about this, with the board's permission, we address the issue um, in that way, mm -hmm. you know, the class time, addressing the modeling of that with the adults, and then we reevaluate where we are at that point, and, and we go from there. I'm just trying to bring a, a wrapper to the, to the discussion mm -hmm. today. You know, on the issue, I think we all recognize on the issue. I've stated my personal belief, you know, on it, and at the same time, the actual managing of the schools is a whole other issue, like culturally, meaning what the parents that we serve as well do, you know, or, or perhaps uh, have a different view on the issue. So. I do have one question. I see, you know, where it's banned that you cannot take photos or videos of um, other children. What is the discipline action that happens? What what level is that? It'd be a level three violation, and uh, that would allow for anything from school-based consequences all the way up to off-campus suspension and a recommendation for expulsion. Okay, and that determination is made by the administration? The administration, and certainly if there was a recommendation for expulsion, it'd be seen through the hearing office and then uh, upwards of the school board if it made it. Not, not every situation is the same. I might go to approach the student, and the student says something to you. Mm -hmm. It could be an unmentionable thing, mm -hmm. and that obviously creates a whole different 
disciplinary incident. Right. So they're not all the same. Right. I just think it's important to be aware of um, that to me is what's scary as a mom. I don't allow my children to have cell phones and social media, but not every parent operates that way. Um, and I spoke with a mom who called me yesterday because um, her daughter was photographed by somebody in a very um, unflattering manner at school and was posted to social media um, talking about her weight. Um, and that kind of stuff happens. It's not, it's not like that's uncommon, unfortunately. And so I just, you know, as a district, I want to make sure that when we become aware of a situation like that, that it's dealt with swiftly and um, with some real consequences. Level three is pretty. Yeah. Schools have been extraordinarily responsive to situations like that, and something like what you're describing would even get into a bullying and harassment type of situation, which of course are zero tolerance. Right. Okay, are we here with that, that discussion? Okay. On to the next one, dress code. So, so on dress code is one of those, those same sort of uh, challenging discussions that you normally brought up by, by the board previously. You can see the red parts there are the changes to the current uh, dress code. There was some revamping in the sense of combining things. Like, for example, rather than trying to spell out every type of head covering, we just called it head covering. There was some more common sense language that was there. Also, the options of what happens at the end was put there. So dress code is one of those things where it's always an enforcement sort of issue. I can always remember as a, uh, as a principal that one of the challenges was every teacher looks at it slightly differently. Right? And so some teachers are much more forceful in the application of the dress code than others would be, making consistency a real challenge. I would say this, the, the number of discipline referrals related to dress code uh, has actually gone down, and there's more enforcement of it. I recognize that not everybody, uh, my fashion sense is not good. Uh, Sue tells me that all the time. And so I kind of like, I look at it and I think, okay, for me and everyone else has a different view of it. Clearly, we don't want students to be inappropriately dressed. Our dress code, by the way, has been successful in the sense that uh, much litigation has been brought forward, particularly in other districts that neighbor us, related to this particular issue. And we've been successful at managing our dress code because one is unisex. There is no sexual um, description, which seemed to be the litigation piece of it related to other districts that surround us. So with that, I'll, I'll open the floor. I just have two things. Actually, the dress code at the thigh, that was good. Because now we don't have to measure. And we got the kids holding their little arms up trying to. All right, so um, <laughs> if we look at short dresses, skirts, and then it says um, middle thigh, if leggings are worn, then the top must come to the middle of the thigh. Well, leggings, jeggings, skinny pants, they are all the same thing. And I know for a fact I do not wear my shirt all the way down to my middle thigh when I wear a pair of jeans. They're almost all the same thing now. I mean, I would say that the shirt to the thigh, you can't even buy those, um, which is limiting a lot of choices for our kids or parents, affordability of clothes. Um, Honestly, if somebody's wearing leggings that are see-through, then that would be a dress code violation. Um, but jeggings, if we're going to put leggings, we need to ch change it to jeggings, skinny pants. I would suggest that we use our common sense, and if something is offensive, then it gets reported as a dress code referral. But um, the shirt to the thigh over a, a, a legging is the part I have like in modern right now. Half of my wardrobe is like that. So I don't think we need to have a, a, a shirt to a thigh with a skinny jean. I'm just gonna put that out there for conversation. And my only other thing is why 
did we um, did we forget to mention sunglasses for a reason? Because I know kids are trying to always wear sunglasses, and we always said they could wear them outside in the sun. Um, that wasn't on here, so I don't even know what our policy is about sunglasses. And the last thing is, why did we take off pajamas and slippers? Like, why are we allowing that now? And that's that's all I have. If someone could help me with that. Do you want to address? Yeah. That? So the the thinking behind the the pajama pants was that through our study, and, and there was a lot of discussion, this was actually in the group that we had for Code of Conduct and Handbook, one of the things that we found the greatest agreement on was the difficulty in differentiating between what is a plaid type of pant with an elastic waistband that could be sold in the young ladies section or the young men section at Kohl's versus an actual pajama pant you know, that you might find uh, you know, in a bin at Walmart or Target or something like that. So really getting down to the granular for, a, for a school staff or an administrator to have to get as granular as to try to identify what the difference is between what I previously described and a pajama pant has become very difficult and I think has created a lot of challenges. The other thing is that, you know, in terms of trying to seek some level of appropriateness, and I'm going to use the term modesty if you'll allow me to do that, um, you know, we felt like the, the pajama pant, although the concern being that it creates maybe a sort of lax atmosphere in a school that, um, you know, that's one of the things that does provide a great deal of, of coverage on the body. And so, you know, again, figuring out the difference between what's, what are plaid pants that might have a pajama pant-esque type of look to them and what are actually pajama pants is a difficult thing to try so to it's a, figure. So the adults that we're worried about, they wouldn't be able to make the distinction because pajama pants are really not appropriate anywhere. And they never will be at work, unless you're in your room at home or in your living room. Um, I mean, uh, I don't... I it, just, was, it was more that what we about couldn't the slippers? find it. It was more that we couldn't really find a good working definition. And of course, I, you know, I, I'm not in the fashion industry, you know, I've, I've only been an educator. <laughs> but I say that in all sincerity that we, we actually have had instances like this come up, most notably a situation in the last month at one of our elementary schools where, you know, I sat down and actually had a lengthy conversation, multiple conversations with a parent who, whose daughter had a situation where she was dress coded for pajama pants, but the father actually brings to me documentation and we looked and these pants which do look like pajama pants and, and that's how I probably would have labeled them. In fact, are something that you would purchase in the girls clothing section. I'm gonna go back to Kohl's and because that's in fact what, what actually happened. And so again, my ability in the six hours and 12 minutes that I mean, I, I don't think this is very campus. often, by the way, that someone's actually wearing a baggy pant that looks like a pajama pant. In my experience in junior high and high school, you can tell a pajama pant. I just feel like that's Pandora's box. There is such a thing in real life as appropriate dress, right? I mean... Yeah, we could... Well, you, you kind of hear, like, the discussion almost. Yeah. Kind of like, we're sitting here spending three minutes explaining the difference of the parent. Having multiple meetings. I mean, what is this like? This. Zero point zero zero percent. We're trying percent? to educate students, and that is still the mission of what we try to do here. Yeah. It's not uh, a cell phone, dress code, or anything else. It's educating students. So I, I don't, I don't have a problem with that, keeping that in there. I'm just saying this is a very good. What about people. the slippers, which are dangerous? Kids wearing slippers. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things also that we felt like was just good, good policy is the more specific, and, and as Mr. Broski mentioned, we, we took out some of the specifics about uh, actual, like, specific head coverings. There were several types of head coverings that were mentioned. And what we felt like is, in some instances, when you're trying to execute and apply policy at the organizational level, that having some generality in there actually allowed for more latitude when you're applying the policy for safety purposes, for modesty purposes, for appropriateness purposes, and so we felt like we kept or maybe even strengthened some of the language about giving administrators uh, or the principal and the principal's designees uh, discretion over things like appropriateness and safety while pigeonholing ourselves by 
I think, getting overly granular in the listings of different items that were prohibited. Yeah. Because the more granular you get when you're listing all of these items, the more room there is to say, well, this particular item that I'm using that you might not feel appropriate, you know, Mr. Jones or, or whomever, um, it's not in your list here. And so that's one of the things we've run into. So we felt like, again, becoming a little bit more general in the policy allowed for maybe a more effective application of, of the safety. For the adults, that's all true. I'm not, I'm not going to debate that, but kids are reading this. And you put it the kids are reading it. So, I mean, that means like a plethora of things. I mean, you don't have to be that direct. So There's no limits. At all. I think that we need to put that back in there. Because I would not send my kid to school in pajamas and think that she was going to have a productive day at school. Especially in secondary. I mean, you're going to leave school and have to dress appropriately. Um, and this is not a high percentage, by the way, Ms. Skipper, of people that Mr. Jones is talking about. This is a very, very small percentage. But when you're looking... I always, I'm listening today mostly from the adult perspective and what administrators' problems they're having. If I'm a child and I'm looking at this, everything's free-for-all right now. Every single thing is a free-for-all when it comes to that section except for the head covering part. And I don't know, you have, you guys have kids, right? I mean, like, if, if it's not spelled out and it's gray, what do they do? They just do it. Um, but here's another thing also I think that we're all forgetting is that we have to prepare these individuals for life after school. Mm -hmm. And I know it's easy. I could have taken the, listen, I have taken every hard road because I am the most hard-headed individual. You know, my husband, my mom, they will both tell you. Just because it's easy doesn't mean it's the best way. And if we are setting a precedence that these kids can show up this way, in a professional environment, then guess what? When they go to a job, they're going to be the most sloppy dressed individual. And I, I mean, I hate to say it, but we all know that in our work environment. There's always that one. And you kind of want to go up to them and be like, did you dress like this in you know, school? I just feel that, like Ms. Hanson is saying, you give them a little bit and they're going to, they're going to. We give them no direction. In this yeah. Well. They, they can wear need, whatever they want. Children need direction, they need stability, they need structure, and we're not setting up for them to, I mean, you have kids now, and, and you can't say you don't, because I've already been to the schools to see it, I mean, they're wearing crop tops. I mean, it's just, and I, and I get it, I mean, what battles do you fight, but you can't wear a crop top in a business environment, or, or a nursing field, or you know, all these other places. And sometimes I do go and I see some of these young children and they go to to job fairs or college fairs or whatever and they, my mind is blown. Who taught you that that was okay? They can't even shake a hand and look you in the eye anymore. And again, I, I know I graduated a good amount of time ago, but it still hasn't been that long ago. And I just feel that we need to look at a bigger picture, at the bigger picture here, that even though it's going to stink, we need to look at each child not as a whole number, but as an individual that we need to take under and educate them and teach them. And yeah, not everybody's going to dress the same way. I'm not saying that. But we need to let them know that it is isn't appropriate to come to school that way. That it's not appropriate to act that way in society. And it's not appropriate when you go for a job interview or college or to create your own business. If you walked into a construction office and a, and a guy got his leg up on the chair sitting in his pajamas, would you hire him as a contractor? Well, you know how you said it's hard to distinguish between, I know what kind of pants you're talking about, and a pajama pant. You're going to have the same problem with the leggings. So, so the leggings, jeggings, and skinny pants, you're going to have that same problem. Um, Again, just to reiterate, in all of these things, it was not, this is not a promotion of a laxed informal dress. This is a larger umbrella with which administrators could execute appropriate dress more effectively because of creating some uh, latitude for them there. When you say top to mid thigh though, you know how many administrators, you know how, do you know how many kids wear leggings, jeggings, and tight pants without shirts to the thigh? This is, that's going to be a huge problem for administrators. I mean, that part alone, if you're going to expect all the kids to wear a shirt to mid thigh when you can't even buy a shirt to mid thigh, 
is going to be a way bigger problem than a pajama. So just to clarify, I want to understand your position on this would be that we should become a little bit more liberal in our enforcement of the allowing the, the more stretchy, loose-fitting pants without the covering? Well, everything is tight just so I now. understand. We can't buy coverings that... I'm just saying that it's impractical. You're going to have to call a dad and say that they keep, they're wearing leggings, he's going to tell you they're wearing jeggings. You're going to say they're wearing jeggings and they don't have a shirt down, but those are skinny pants. I don't need a shirt down to my thigh. So again, I, I want to just... This was a hypothetical that came I would just up like because modesty we, had, we had many... Um, high school representatives and secondary representatives on on the committee again we need I feel like our, our position as a committee was that we felt like we needed that latitude in there because given that this is a unisex dress code we're going to have situations where you may have a very stretchy material and again this is never a conversation I thought I'd have as a, a, a educator <laughs> in two decades in this but there are situations where you could have very stretchy material mm -hmm too tight fitting. But that would be under on, appropriate, right? The, the, absolutely, but again, we, we need to have that latitude. The thinking was we need to have that latitude in order to maintain at least a level, a base level of modesty on, on campuses. Now... No, I totally get it. Maybe I, let me try to rephrase one thing. What I, what, can I interject? I'm trying to say that <laughs> jeggings, leggings, they're all the same thing. Okay. What, what if you said, what if we just added one word? What if... Um, where it says because uh, no one's going to wear a shirt leggings are worn, um, I'm trying to make it easier for you where it says if leggings are worn then the top must come I would say if transparent leggings are worn or um, see through I don't know how you if would leggings, that, jeggings or tight skinny things that, are worn that will, that will delineate it from appropriate coverage are we know. considering athletic leggings to be like, I what, what, is, what are athletic leggings considered? Because everybody wears these pants. Yeah, I mean, everybody wears athletic leggings on that. They're not going to wear a shirt okay, to their side. So, uh, women generally at the gym, if they're wearing pants. Understood, like a yoga leggings, pant or something yes. like that. Uh -huh. yeah. So, that would be considered, that would fall into this, that we wouldn't have you know, yoga pants being worn about. That would be considered leggings. So that be, well, okay, so that would be leggings. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't but know. Again, I have a problem with the shirt to the thigh thing. In, in my <laughs> research, I, I would, I think, again, this is so granular into this, so please forgive me in my ignorance, but in my research into this, differentiating a legging from a jegging, there are some actual definitions out there yeah, on that. Okay. And the jegging piece is that there are, um, I don't remember the technical fashion term, but there is a riveting or a, 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 a stitching. Okay. Now, can they be? What's the difference between a jegging and a stretchy jean that's made by American Eagle? This is my point. Are we requiring everybody with tight pants that could be see-through when worn inappropriately to wear a shirt to the thigh? That's what I'm, all I'm asking. No, ma'am. So as this reads, because I wouldn't again if I were very the, difficult. as the vice principal at Lake Asbury Junior High School last year, I would not have, I, I would not have conceived of a jegging as being leggings that would not have comported with me and I think did anybody ever wear a shirt to their thigh with tight pants Mary that, Tyler Moore. I, mean, uh, I, uh, I taught at Oakley but I'm just here to tell you that nobody's wearing any shirt coming out of a school to last year the thigh or to cover the buttocks yeah, uh, it says mid -thigh. which are you re maybe that could be a clarification uh, could you be quick? <laughs> are you referring to in the dress code when you say thigh are you referring to the top where the it's shirt would flag. cover the buttocks or are you actually talking about men? Maybe that would help. This is a long shirt. You have to buy. She wants you to just cover the long tunic. Right. Because you're, you're yeah, wearing you a nightgown. You have to buy a tunic. So th this would be, if we don't like the term, maybe the term shirt in and of itself is, is maybe creating the confusion. Because this would be a tunic in your any fashion top, design. Any, any fashionable top that would be covering a, a person's torso and their buttocks that area, fine. that would need to go down. That could be something like a shorter dress or any top, whether it be a shirt or anything that you would consider to be a top torso cover. Like a tunic. A tunic I mean, mid-thigh, though, that's... She just wants you to change it from mid-thigh to, like, thigh. Just, how about just... To cover the butt. Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about that. a mid-thigh. It's a tunic. It's a dress. And so, like, if you're not going to wear a dress and you want to wear uh, an oversized T-shirt, as long as my bottom is covered, 
then what does it matter as long as it doesn't go to here? Because now I'm wearing a nightgown. You can buy two nights. You know what I mean? As long as the, the kid's not like tying it up here and their bottoms are showing. You know? So I think it's so I'm certainly fine. to the board's discretion. What I want to be clear on before we include any additional policy or wording in here, what the board is, is suggesting is that we bring the hemline of the covering up even higher when there are stretchy pants being worn. Well, of, of course, you, so you cannot buy tunics. What, you, what we're requiring here, this is, I'm just telling you, everybody's going to break this dress Michelle, code. Just say, just say We're bye. just going to break just the dress say, code. Instead of mid-thigh, just say bye. Will that fit? Because then it Does anybody understand that you can't buy the these kind of clothes? I, I think what I'm understanding is that she wants to strike the whole thing. You don't want us to regulate unless it's what they wear. Unless like. an administrator it's sees fine. that it's sheer or see-through. It's fine unless you're seeing skin. Is that what I'm understanding? I mean, if yeah. you can see body parts or skin, then it so needs look, to be covered I'm with up you, otherwise. Mr. Jones. Yes, if the administrator looks at it and it's inappropriate, we make a call. But just having on leggings itself is not inappropriate with a short or a long shirt. And would it make sense also, would it be reasonable to also have the same level of latitude then on the, the pajama pant type situation? And, and my thinking, again, and this, this was not just my thinking, I should say that. And I the apologize thinking, to everybody, but I, this is one thing I know. We, we did have a lengthy discussion. The struggle of leggings is committee. real. And the committee feeling was that as much as the concern of a pajama pant creating a lax atmosphere, would yoga pants not also create the same lax atmosphere? Well, I wear my yoga pants on cruise ships because they're very expensive and nice, but <laughs> it just depends on what kind of yoga pants. See what I mean? Yes, you get into this big wormhole, it just depends. I don't, I don't think it's Administrators just need to make decisions. And no pajama. And administrators need to make good decisions, and I have faith in our administrators to make good decisions. I don't necessarily think we have to tell parents to go buy tunics. Honestly, we need to count. We need to talk to our kids in the beginning of each year. We need to set that standard. Administrators can make decisions based on modesty or is it appropriate or distracting like fishnet stockings. We know that's not appropriate. We just take them off. So I don't know what we could do about this part, but I can tell you we have limited people to a certain kind of pants and a certain kind of top that really is hard. I don't know. I'm tall. I don't know if you guys have tried to buy tunics. It's almost impossible to buy tunics for all my pants, so. Does the board have a recommendation on language that you'd like to see? I don't know how you guys feel about just taking that part out and dressing appropriately, and if an administrator sees something that's inappropriate, the administrator addresses that. I'd like to add the pajamas back in. That's just my personal opinion. I'm fine with adding pajamas back in. I think, um, slippers, et cetera, that line. I'm I sure think. When I read this about leggings, what I read is um, if it's skin tight, then you need to have something over it. So whether it's, um, it doesn't really matter what, mm. what are qualified. To me, leggings mean that it is as tight as your skin. So if Overly it is form fitting, form fitting. Some right. type of language. Oh, my so, so what if it was something to the effect of form fitting and reveals undergarment? I don't think it even necessarily oh, needs to reveal their underwear. Well, I don't know. 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 I it is going to be a nightmare to regulate what a legging, a jegging, and a tight pant is. I think the with middle the thigh portion is going to be, be consistent with, because if it's skin tight, what's the difference? Right. You know what I mean? So I think they're trying to be consistent with, your shorts have to be mid-thigh. If you're wearing skin tight leggings, then you're also going to be covered mid-thigh. It's well, consistency. Uh, well, yeah. But so, I mean, I, yeah. But I'm just saying, I mean, uh, and your comment, your comment about is, crop tops, it's covered in here. Shirts must cover the yeah, shoulder and not now, expose undergarments. Torso. Well, it said the midriff before. Yeah, but and now we're adding any part of the torso because now you have a lot of backless shirts. So I just need help figuring out that jegging part because I think it's going to be real difficult to determine the appropriateness of all three different kinds of pants with the length of the shirt. Yeah, Mr. Bigner, do you have something to help? 
you've already got in the student code of conduct and also in 4.03 student dress a paragraph that says in 403, nor shall they be dressed in a manner which causes an interference with work or creates classroom or school disorder. Right. So the same have thing to do in that. the existing code of conduct it says clothing this year we dressed in clothing is tailored in such a manner that because of fit, design, color, texture, or inadequate coverage of the body does not create a classroom or right. school disruption so as determined by the administration. Let me take it out. Oh. There are young ladies that I've seen going to the schools and others, parents, who are wearing leggings or yoga pants or whatever that are so tight that there is yes. zero left to the imagination. Yes. I'm not talking about panty lines, I'm talking about no panties at all, whatever. Right. But they are so skin tight that they're distracting. And that's not what we wrote here. We wrote and I jeggings. think if you we wrote that, yeah. what you've already got. I agree with you. We wrote jeggings with a long top. We didn't write anything like that. We didn't write if it's a, dis if it's I mean, a disruption, it's a disruption. Yeah. Okay. If so I think I think the challenge is when you, when you come up with a definition, the purpose of the definition is to provide clarity. Clearly, <laughs> why have you seen the difficulty in enforcement? Because you all can't agree right. on what should happen, right? We we I've heard a couple of things. I've heard more strict in certain areas, and I've heard less strict in certain areas from the very board, right? So so the issue becomes the actual enforcement of it. And I would just say as a as a principal many times over, I, I would always get into these discussions with teachers. So the teachers to monitor the dress code and send them to to me. Because my response was when the teachers said you would say to me, you know, you didn't agree with the this dress code. I said, tell me the person that was sent to me that I didn't deal with. Uh, the answer is none. And so it makes it very challenging. So I think I heard some sort of consensus there, putting the pajamas and stuff back in there, just so it's in writing uh, for the purpose of clarity. And then the issue of uh, leggings, jeggings, and, and all the rest. And tunic tops. It's very challenging because I think the intent was to have modesty. I know the intent. Related to, to that issue. And here's, so, so here's the thing, if there is, if a parent has a question, <coughs> you can always talk to your administrator or your teacher to say, is this appropriate? So we all want the shirts to be mid-thigh? Is that where we're going with this? Well, Just keep it when, at mid-thigh? When I read this, I read that if it is a skin-tight mm -hmm. bottom, then it needs to have a covering over it. And I don't Well, that's what we that. should say. If it's inappropriately skin-tight, it needs to be covered. Remember what we're saying now is, sex. yeah, I mean, if it's distracted to the learning environment, it needs to go. I just think administrators can make that call. We don't need to have leggings in there, but, or long shirts. How do you guys feel about it? I think it I just want to enforce because I know some teachers have some other people on the dress code and some administrators are a little more lenient than others. So if it's handled in the way that you you have handled it, whether they believe or not, whatever is appropriate, they need to stick with that. Could we just say appropriately covered or yeah. modestly covered or shorts, dresses, and skirts mid -thighs. should come to the middle of the thigh if leggings are worn then the top must appropriately cover the backside. Or like Mr. Victor said, not just the learning environment. Yes, covers, your, covers you modestly. Okay. Yeah. Because you want the front side covered too on some pieces. <laughs> okay. I think, I think we provided some direction for it. I think, I think we, if anything, we've proven the difficulty <laughs> in it by our discussion. Right? <laughs> so that's why you would always have these difficulties. 34 years, the same topic has been talked about all 34 years. This is not anything new under the, under the sun. Okay, the last topic, student uh, conduct in the restroom. So there's two parts to this. One is the code of conduct piece, which is the all red paragraph that you see. And the other is a board policy draft. So let's talk about the student code of conduct piece. So we thought it'd be important to, since we were writing a part about uh, using the restroom, which corresponds to your biological sex at birth, we thought it was also, maybe we should kind of delineate some of those other things that are good bathroom habits. 
Um, I didn't see there. hand washing in here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we figured we'd attempt to cover it all. Though I would be quick to point out there are some things that are just, you know, uh, not written that are, that are understood to be things that people are supposed to do. But since we were including that piece, it made, it made sense to include the other, the other pieces to it. Um, but I, I thought that this, I didn't see anything that I would think would create controversy. And so I'll just throw the discussion back. I have no marks. What's that? I have zero marks on my paper. All right. Well um, done. Well, we're talking about we're talking about this one. Here. Oh no, that yeah, part. There's no, uh, <laughs> no marks on that either. So we're all good. I, have to I would like to ask um, just in the first section, not that it would make a difference, but um, in the very first line where it says "should," should can we be a little more? Direct and say students will not perform. On the top? Yeah. Students should make every effort to maintain it in the sheet one you do. May. So instead of should, just replace it with shall? Or shall. Yeah, and the, and the only reason is we give too much leeway. And yeah, yeah, that's probably should or shall, yeah. 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 Try to be a little more verbally forceful with them. Yeah. Wow, that's so. the that that is the best conversation that we've had. I mean, this was so direct. <laughs> so, so let's <laughs> great job, committee. <laughs> <this one. laughs> you know, like, now the actual draft uh, policy. You might bring that out there for your discussion. And, I just want to, since I'm bringing this to the board, I just want to say um, I agree with taking line four out because uh, I didn't really agree with that. However, I think that this should not be limited to students. I think it should be students and staff, which I asked Mr. Booker. I don't think. No. Yeah, the student and staff part. I just, I'm kind of, or like, like I don't want to limit it to students is what I'm saying. I think it should be for everybody. That um, you have to we use. have our staff bathroom, so I mean, I'm just, okay. it wouldn't. Yeah, teachers usually don't. We don't use their bathrooms. They don't use student bathrooms. Or locker rooms. Well, I mean, I, I don't want it to limit to visitors. And I mean, you need to go use your designated bathroom. So if a, a parent comes in and wants to use the boys' bathroom, you either need to use a single stall or you need to go use the girls' bathroom. So I'm saying I don't want this limited to just students. I want this to be... And we have proper. bathrooms for them at the front door, mm -hmm. male and female faculty bathrooms for parents. Which are single stall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number three, um, and I've discussed this with Mr. Bittner, but I'm wondering for where it says a different consideration for any reason may, upon approval, should should we make that upon written approval? Because how are we going to know? I've had this this type of scenario happen uh, a few times as a as a high school principal, and not for the for the purposes of of this particular policy. But I, I did have a parent that came to me and just said, "Hey, I have an issue with shyness." You know, can we? Can you help him out? He, he feels like every time he goes to the restroom, there's a group of other boys in there. So can you help him out and, and give another area? Sure, we give you another area. We help anybody out that needed help. Right. I think that that was the intent. That it might not yeah. be. I just I'm thinking, how is somebody else that sees this going to know? Other than they're going to say, oh, I had approval. You know, how are we going to really know that? Well, it's the administrator that gives the approval. Yeah. So either the administrator did or didn't. It's pretty Typically, easy to find like out. when we do something like that, we're making an exception. We give them, a, we'll give them a pass. Okay. And besides, a person. I mean, do teachers a, still give them in their planner permission to use a restroom? So yeah. it should be in their that they have permission. But if they're well, using a special restroom, such as a, yeah, a, you know, such as a clinic restroom mm -hmm. or not, we would. Work that out. Okay. Usually there's a I just wanted to different. say the procedure. So you could staple a little know. thing in their planner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But the next line where it says, by the school or building administration, do we need to be a little clearer or just leave it as administration? Take out school. Or by the school administration? Yeah, school administration, because school is a noun. Well, but we have. Buildings that are not schools, 
and there are administrators in charge of those buildings, so I would probably leave all of that language so that the expectation is regardless of which building a student is in, they need approval. If you don't want um, on a field trip for kids to come use, I don't know that we have field trips at the district office, but let's say that we did. <laughs> um, they would need approval to use a single cell bathroom by an adult that's in charge of that building, I would think. Most most places now are, are all single. There's very few places. Does the word school refer to school personnel? School is just a single noun. Are we referring to people working in the school? Um, which which number are you referring to? Number three, oh, right. the one Beth just. So why don't you just put school administration or building? Or school personnel or building. Or repetitive, but because staff can give permission too. Or, I mean. The way that it's written, administration would apply to either the school or another building. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote it that way because we have food, transportation. Uh, any place down here in Green Cove Springs, um, field houses, athletic areas, things that are not generally governed mm -hmm. by the principal, and and facilities that aren't governed by anybody other than administrator of the building. So okay, yeah. that's why I wrote it the way I wrote it. Any, any other? Related? Yeah, that makes sense that you'd have like the athletic director yeah. at a school would maybe make a call for a student who needed accommodations for the locker room. Or, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay, wow. Okay. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Okay, so we have one, one last topic uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention. We need to come up with a date to do interviews for the um, school board attorney position. And in addition, I would kind of point out that one of the things uh, that we should discuss now is I'd like to bring an agenda item that would rescind uh, Mr. Bickner's uh, resignation so he can stay on longer in the transition. This does not mean that we're delaying hiring a board school board attorney. We would set a date, we'd interview, we'd hire the attorney, but it would allow a trans transition time. Because as it stands right now, Mr. Bickner's last day is April 14th, and I believe it would be impossible to have a transition within that time within that time frame, given that we're almost to the, um, the end of March right now. Yeah, quick question. Um, I know I think the end of January we still only had like three candidates and then suddenly we had 13. <laughs> Are we still receiving candidates? Mr. Ms. Trapman? The postings are not open. We could open the, we could reopen the postings. Um, I can say that that would require more funding, but that's up to y'all. And well, we're not, well, yeah. So, are you asking? Are the same people still interested? The same people that we that I had stated before, the ones that y'all said that you voted on, that you wanted to interview, I emailed all of them. Every one of them have replied that they are still interested, and just simply let them know when the new interview dates will be. Um, if you want to open it back up, you know, we, but that would take a longer time because it needs to be posted for at least, you know. Two weeks, I don't think you're going to get much compared to what we got before. And um, But if you want to, we can absolutely reopen it. Well, we interview what we have, and then if we don't, it's May. Yeah, because I didn't realize that. You do not have to select one of the ones if you interview and you're not happy with the candidates. We can go back out and start over. Correct. Right. I think that's prudent. We we promised these folks an interview. Mm -hmm. I think we need to move forward with that. And then, yeah. like you said, if, if we're not pleased after the interviews, we can go to put it back out at that point. Um, I heard from Ms. Bola. She's available just about any day in April um, to schedule uh, interviews. I don't know if you guys want to look at your calendars now or if you want some time and we can make a decision at the board meeting. Maybe let's try to pick a date. Today? Yeah. Okay. Let's start. All right. I can do any Tuesday and Thursday. That's so like the fourth or the... Tuesdays work best for me. Okay. 
Um, so, we all did a fourth. April 4th would be very difficult because I'm sorry, because of the required um, posting that we have to put out to advertise, advertise it. Yeah, to advertise For how many days? Seven. Seven, seven days, and that would be seven days. So there's a couple of days lag to get it there, right. so they have it in there for seven days. So the 11th, is that too? I can do the 11th. Is that too far away? Or too short a time? Mm -hmm. I, I believe it is. So the Clay Today only publishes on Thursday, and the deadline to submit an advertisement is Monday noon. So we would, the earliest we could submit and have it published would be April 6th. So the earliest interviews could take place would be the 13th. Okay. So then April 18th. How about April 10th? 12th, Wednesday? You, she Everybody open it. Tuesdays are, are best for me with my job. Yeah. The 18th works for me. That. Can everybody do the 18th or the 25th? The 25th is our workshop. If you guys want to tag it on, the we 18th can the 18th. Yeah. So two options. Yeah, we we could do it the 18th or the we 18th. could do it the 25th and then we'd have the agenda review followed mm -hmm. by all of the interviews. So if we did it that way, I would just request to the district that we don't add anything to that agenda review workshop, <laughs> that we just review the agenda. So it should be short and sweet, and then we can move over to um, attorney interviews and do it all in one day. The 25th? What day? The 25th. So far away. So is it almost five weeks from now? Four and a half. Yeah, four weeks from now. That's a long time. I mean, we could do that. You want to do the 18th? That's that up way. to you guys. It's just a difference of a week. You want to do the 18th? Because the earliest she said you could do it is the 13th. I mean, Ms. Rotman, if we, and that's a long way away in the next workshop, but whenever we do the interviews, what happens after? We, if we decide on one, what's that timeline like? They're immediately hired. We would bring yeah, a contract. Yeah, y'all would vote on who so you select. I mean, once we vote. So once that? you vote, you, you have a candidate, then um, we would offer the position to the candidate. Then, of course, if you're writing a contract, and bringing forth a contract for the board to approve, mm -hmm. whether or not there's a layover in time for the new board attorney to start is, uh, you know, it depends on what their current job is and, and all of that kind of stuff. So there's a time yeah. difference there. I would kind of think that maybe the first discussion should be, yeah. you know, Mr. Bickner's last day is the 14th as it stands now. I suggested that we're in order the process to change that is the rescinding of his current uh, letter of resignation. I don't see any, and part of that is that Mr. Bick, Mr. Bick has to be willing to do that, and I think Mr. Victor would, based on my conversation with him, be willing to do that if he knew that he had the confidence of the board in the interim related to that. And so I'd like to hear from the board as to whether or not they're in agreement with that, keeping in mind there is no way you're going to hire another attorney mm -hmm. in the time that that occurs. Right. And, uh, go ahead, Mr. I think you also need to understand I have real reluctance to to do this. I tendered my resignation with 16 weeks of notice for a reason. Mm -hmm. My biggest concern is, someone approached and said, well, you, are you willing to do this? I said, I'll have to go and talk to my wife about it, and I'll have to think about it. I've done both. My reluctance to do this is that if I extend this, I want to go to the end of the contract, which is December the 28th. That's what my contract says. Yes. I rescinded my, and, and I, I resigned because there were people on the board that wanted me gone. If I can't have five board members that are behind me to stay through December the 28th, I don't want to stay. Do I like my job? I love what I do. Am I overworked? Yes. Do I need a second attorney, which would be the equivalent of a staff attorney? that you could hire with a two-year experience and get for seventy-five dollars or $80,000? I need that desperately. But what I really need is five people that want me here. 
And if I only have two for three, I can't stay. There's no security there. It is unfortunate that we had 16 weeks. And we're still sitting here looking at a date anymore. a month from now. That is, for me, a month, I mean, this was, I actually spoke with Ms. Gilhausen about this. It is a, it's unfair. We should have been able to get the job done. Um, and now what to do to move forward. And when we talk about the 25th, that's another month. Um, I understand where Mr. Bickner's. But first things first, are five of you willing for me to stay here? Can I have a commitment from five board members that says, we want you here until December the 28th? We've had a conversation, and you know that I am willing. I know that you are. I don't know about Mrs. Clark. I don't know about you. I know Mrs. Bola would go along with that, and I don't know about Mrs. Skipper. But that's what, that's important to me, and it's important to me for a couple of reasons. Practicing law is a matter of trust. You trust me to keep you out of trouble, and I trust you to watch my back. That's all. And that's what the trust is. And if the trust is broken, if the trust is gone, then I need to know that. Because I have other, I have, I do actually have other things that I can do. I'm not tired and I'm not addled yet. <laughs> and so I'm going to keep, I've had offers to go practice all elsewhere. So if, if five of you don't want me, that's I think okay. The, I think Just the tell problem me now. for me is putting a December date on it because if we're having this difficulty, getting someone um, or even getting to the interview process how are we going to we're either going to be having somebody on board midsummer now we're paying more than we need to be paying for both parties i just putting a date on this tough for me putting a date on me right i understand that but that's what I have to deal with as well. For you to say it's tough for you because now you've got to think about money. So do I. For you, I've had time to sit down and figure out where I'm going and to make plans for where I'm going and places to go. And so I don't really, I'm, I'm fine with leaving. But for somebody to say, okay, well, we want you to stay, but when we get tired of you or when we don't need you anymore, you're gone. That takes away all the security that I have built into the system which I built into my contract with Mrs. Bola's help. There was security both for the school board and for me. He gave four months to find a replacement. He gave me four months to find a place to go. Yes. That's no longer there if you're going to do this. And in all fairness, we have some good candidates. Um, the first seven day thing, we messed up about the you know sunshine. And then we picked a date that we all couldn't be here together. That is not Mr. Bickner's fault. And um, if I leave on the 14th, I'm a phone call away. Yeah. I have, a, I have a, an offer to start on the 21st of April. That's, that's an additional six days. If somebody needs me, I come in for six days. I don't care. I don't have any hobbies. I work. <laughs> that's what I do. I think we should do our interviews as soon as possible. We had 16 weeks. We had candidates apply. I just... I think the question is, if we do it, we're saying we have to do it, allow Mr. Bickman to stay on till December. To the end of my country. If we interview? Period. Right. But if we get somebody next month, we're not going to need from April till December. Why can't we have both? Yeah. I, I would. He can be district and we can have a board. But I'm burning bridges. That's he the can. thing. You may not need me after two months from now, but I will burn the bridges this week. Well, what I'm saying is, is if we keep you till December, I know FSBA has discussed um, having two different attorneys. So you either have a board attorney and a district attorney. So for the six, seven months, why don't we do that? Why don't we hire our own attorney and then Mr. Bickner can have... I mean, what's the cost of something like that? Well, Mr. Victor just told you, if you, if you hired a staff attorney... If you hire a staff attorney and you get a newbie out of the state attorney's office, the public defender's office, the general counsel's office, the AG's office, with two to three years experience, you can get an attorney that will learn a job for $75,000, $80,000, maybe eighty-five. I'm guessing, but I'm telling you what I think rationally and reasonably because 
people in the state attorney's office, public defender's office, and the AD's office are working for under that. They learn something, they have a place to go, and, and it's important to them, I think, to move on. But they are not the school board attorney. They don't walk in with any knowledge. And so what they have to have is somebody there to teach them. When I came to this job in 2000, Frank Scrooby had sat in that chair for 35 years. He was one day a week and one night a month. And I sat with him every month for a year. And I did the stuff off job, off site, with phone calls and going to IEP meetings and mm -hmm. just everything that I could critical. do to involve myself. Yeah. So that by the time Frank walked out the door, I, in all honesty, felt like any more than Frank. Mm -hmm. And Frank had been doing it for forever. So what you need is a staff attorney because if, if you think that everything I do all day long is school board work, that's not true. No, I, I've had 15 the very phone calls yeah, where I walked Michelle, in the board. The transition was important to how me. How much the very would beginning. it be? How could we modify? Because I don't, I don't want to go to the DA. I don't want to do all of that. I want to interview the people that we have that have applied. Could we essentially modify their job um, till December as a school board attorney? meaning we utilize them just for you know the school board portion and then Mr. Fickner keep his contract till December as a district attorney because this this is a thing they do this and we hire our school board attorney and at the end of December we increase the the hours the job description the pay or whatever to a full-time attorney once he has gone to How would they learn? So like, where's the transition? So there's two, well, there's they, two things. Some of them have experience, and then whoever we pick, so some mm -hmm. did have experience, and then um, they, they could resource, and we, we form out a lot that, of our stuff. Because his knowledge, after all these years, well, the whole still reason, working alongside the whole reason I wanted to do it was because I felt the t transition with Mr. Bigner was really the most important thing well, that's what for us as a county. That's what I'm trying to tell you. They so, would still be So the answer to your question is yes, you can do that. And that is a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Alachua County has that kind of model presently in place. So the question really is, just listening to everybody around, is, is the, the way that that's done, by the way, because there's a human resource piece of this, okay. you, have, you have somebody that has a uh, resignation letter that's tendered, the process to make that go away is for the board to take action to right. rescind that. What you heard Mr. Bickner emphatically say is he's got other offers on the table. He loves this place, would like to stay, but needs that commitment of December, uh, December which would fulfill his contract. So, so to answer your question, yes, there would be a consent item for the rescinding of Mr. Bickner's um, letter of resignation, which would then put his current contract into play. To Ms. Clark's concern about the December um, time frame, yeah, a, I mean, I, I get that, but I also get that it would be a commitment of the board here. But can we do what I'm asking? Is that a thing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's you, what you, I want to yeah, know. Can, can do you do that so that we can still interview the people that we want and we can still pick who we want as a board, still so, keeping Mr. Bickner on so he can help with the transition, the responsibilities still, still show the new school board attorney, but at that point, to give him some relief, essentially, they would show up at the school board meetings and wor workshops or whatever, and you would deal with the district stuff, and they would deal with the school board attorney, so it wouldn't necessarily be a full-time position until December when he's gone. Does that make so, sense? So the challenge with that is that the people that are right interviewing mm -hmm. for the yeah. position are going to want full-time employment yeah. because they're not going to want to give up their current did you, did you, uh, could we ask them for that? Can we, that's what I'm saying, could you modify the position? Is that another so many days? Can that's we afford two attorneys? Right, I was going to state that this position was advertised as a full term okay. and I, a salary range was given. So I think it would be, you would have to be transparent to your applicants that whatever it is your expectation is so that they know whether or not they still want to interview. Okay. So and 
can, if we interview them, can we afford both? Yes. Okay. So why don't we do that? Why don't we extend his contract, interview to an, um, the people that we want to interview, keep them both on, they can work side by side, he can train them, and go from there. Because we're going to lose money either way. I'm in favor of that. And I, what I don't want to lose is continuity. And I fear that if Mr. Brickner leaves on the 14th, and we're in a pinch to hire, what if we interview and we don't want to select any of those candidates? Like, there's a lot of variables here, and I don't feel comfortable leaving the district exposed Without legally any lawyer, right? um, while we're making this decision. So it's while I understand ability. nobody wants to spend that extra money, I don't see that we have a choice and also provide a reasonable amount of legal services. I would services also add many districts, including black women, do have two attorneys. Right. I would also add that the Board of County Commissioner actually has three right. you know, attorneys. Right. And we're, we're not, like, overstaffed in the attorney realm. <laughs> right. right. Well, I just want to make sure we could afford it, first of all. But then, second of all, it is a person of our choosing, the board's right. choosing. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I, I, I want that to be, because it's, it's very important. Um, I know it's very important to me because of, of my viewpoints. So I just want to make sure that we get to hi we get to interview who is set to interview to be interviewed. Yeah, that was going to be one. Of, and he, yes, it's not just about money, but I'm you know we set the goalpost at December, and now we're still can't make December for some reason. So right. it's not just a money thing, but. Um, I've continued to hear that the attorney is used 90% for the district, 95% for the district. We've got a ton of contracts. That's a big, big issue. Um, but I also hear that this is our attorney, and this is the one employee that we get to hire. Mm -hmm. And yet we're also understaffed in the attorney role. Mm -hmm. So why don't we look at the one and a half attorney situation? And we hire who we need for the school board, and we leave the district attorney in place, whatever we need, um, and at least consider it. So. Well, I think you're bringing a lot of valid points. I, I think for now, the question becomes, what do we do now? Right. So clearly, the, the thing that's been brought forward is the rescinding of the current letter of right. resignation, yeah. which would then put his contract in place through December to allow that, mm -hmm. you know, over time. But really, it comes down to—I hate to say it this way—it really comes down to Mr. Bigner. Right. So, right. What's it, what say you, Mr. Bigner? I think what I'm hearing Ms. Skipper say, and what I'm what I'm pulling out of this is change my contract so that I am the staff attorney rather than the school board attorney. No. And I'm then you saying, hire your own school board attorney. No, no, well, at first, but then they said that we could afford both of you. Yeah. So you would both just be alongside each other till your December contract. So I know one of the things that was a priority to me, um, we had a, an internal audit done August 2019 for the half cent sales tax. Mm -hmm. And again, and they reviewed it in August of 2020. And one of the consistent themes in there was the um, outdated policies that we had. Mm -hmm. So one of my priorities was to actually go through um, the policy section by section. That'll be an immense amount of work uh, if we start to look at every single policy section by section. I think that it would be in the board's best interest to have two school board attorneys until Mr. Bickner's contract ends in December, if that's what you... Sound, it sounds like, and then, correct me if I'm wrong, that sounds like where everybody is. Yeah. But he would be, he's the lead. I mean, he would have, yeah. I, mean, I think maybe part of your concern, Mr. Bickner, is the role you would play, maybe, or... I don't understand. If you have two attorneys, how do you see that working? I don't have a problem with working with someone as long as as long as I know who they are. Mm -hmm. Before, when we had two attorneys, as school board attorney, you had Frank Screwy and myself. But remember, Frank was a one day. The way it all happened was, I brought everything in house. All of the things we sent out. I brought in, and I started doing all the IEP meetings and all the IDEA stuff and yes. all the phone calls from the schools and on and on and on because it made no sense right. the way that it was set up before. And that's how it came to be a five-day full-time job. I can do that, and I'm still I'm happy to do that, 
And I've even told Mr. Brosky, if you get to December the 28th and you have a problem, I'm not going anywhere after that. I'm done. You know, I'm 76 years old, and I have other things I want to do besides yeah. this. I hope. And so, well, I I'm hope going you to, have other yeah, things. I've got a PhD to finish, and I've got yes. a couple of other things. And so, I've told him that if you get to the 28th of December and you haven't gotten there yet, yeah. put me month to month. I'll yeah. keep coming back until until my biggest concern is the district. It's not me. Yeah. No, I just At wanted to know how you felt about it. My biggest concern is I think that I'm being treated poorly because I have basically made plans. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have to burn the bridges, and I don't like burning bridges. But I can do it. So what do you, well, what do you think? Well, I assumed we'd be a month-to-month -month situation. Anyway, I didn't, I can't I didn't do realize that. the December. And I would think you'd be in the same boat come December if you're... Unless I, that I, and I planned on that. But I'm not going to plan on that between now and December. I either want a commitment to finish me out, or I'm going to start somewhere else the 21st of April. And that's so we not have a threat, a and I'm not being ugly. It's the way I feel. Do we have a model? Something we've done before? Yeah, other, yeah, it just works itself out? Yeah. So what do, you, what do you guys think? It sounds like there's, there's cons I'm going to consider this consensus, this, I mean, and you can't vote, which would mean this. And, and I think that means a lot to Mr. Bickner because when I had the discussion with Mr. Bickner, I don't think you mind me sharing this. He said, you know, I just want to make sure the people that I work for want me to be here. Right? Mm -hmm. It sounds like it sounds like the consensus is there for that to occur. So on the board agenda. And we can afford a second attorney. Yes. Yeah. So there be a consent that, agenda item. Is that where we're at truly, Ms. Skipper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. they can work alongside. I, I don't want. I, I want you guys to be equal, and then you train the mm -hmm. attorney or, or educate the attorney. Not necessarily train. I don't like to use that word, but educate the attorney on how school things life. are done in school, school life, what you do, um, all that, and that gives us. If we hire them at the end of this month, um, that gives us enough time uh, between now and then for them to be self-sufficient either after you know, you leave or whatever we decide from December. But then that also gives you some relief, you know, having two two attorneys. But you're good with me until December, the end of December, the end of that contract? Yes. Yes, sir. And Ms. Clark, are you as well? Yes, if we can't do a month to month, I, I, I understand. I can't do a month to month. That's, there's I no have, security there at all. That's what I just said, I was trying to say. Okay. Yes. If, it's, if I've got five people, I'm happy. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my wife and I'll let you know in the morning. But it's so I'm, I'm I just want to say way. thank you for your patience because well, 16 weeks you, is right? a long but time. The yeah. confidence is important to me because I have all of the people on this wall and all of the people at the schools that call me for, and they have confidence in what I do. I've learned and when I have a vote of no started. confidence from my board, it makes me feel like my employer doesn't want me, but the people I serve do, which yeah. makes no sense to me. I okay. can't do that. So can I just have one clarification? Did we settle on the date? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I was, yeah. Gonna, I was like, well, there was discussion. Well, there's well, right? not a major hurry if we rescind his when resignation. Is, yeah. So we could wait till so the next so workshop, like Ashley said. So 25th, Ms. Okay. Ms. Trump. 18th. <laughs> the 25th <laughs> is the, <laughs> <day>. <laughs> the workshop date. Uh, We're stuck yes. with Mr. Yes. Vickner now. The workshop date. So we do the agenda <laughs> review followed by all of that. You take your time so on that. I will create a schedule similar to the one I did before and contact all the candidates. And may I ask, I think, didn't we have just four that we were going to interview? Because I thought you were shooting for five. No, there's... There are five. I think there's five. I thought there was Because I've only grabbed... It, it, I will double check my schedule and I will send all of y'all an email with a date and time to confirm. Are you interested in reopening that at all? Because I know of people that are thinking. That would be the So voice. if we're doing the 25th, now do we have time to reopen and try to, and what is the cost? Oh, well, you got to advertise, don't you? You have to do all that mess again. And pay for it? Okay, so we yeah, can't do no, it by the time. Let's not do that. All right. I mean, you can hire who you, you can. want. You, hiring a professional does not come under taking bids or anything else. You don't have to follow any procedure. It's entirely up to how you want to do it. Now I'm confused. I mean, I did have some concern that the uh, candidate... You still have to give public notice, but we need experience. Right. You still have to have an agenda. You have to do all of those things at the APA. 
but you don't have to. So we could reopen it and then we could, um, we would just have to commit on our part to review those resumes promptly and mm -hmm. submit the um, applicants that we want to interview. To and include Scotland. the ones we were going to, is that and how that I, works? And include the ones that we were going to interview and then we would need. So we could get more candidates? Well, I think what we could do is um, just reevaluate the whole stack of candidates yeah. and then select the top five and submit that to Ms. Troutman. And if we could all do that by April 18th, it would give that um, the new applicants a week's notice that we're going to interview. Just reiterate, it's been 16 weeks. Yeah, yes. it's a long time. 16 weeks. I've never, yeah. Yeah. 16 16 weeks. I never thought we'd and be in this place. And how many times in the district have we heard that this isn't a popular hour or job or whatever? Like, it's been I a just, long time. So you don't want to reopen it? No. Now. That's okay. This we don't have to reopen it. It's so drug out. It's, it's a but it wouldn't change the timeline at all. We'd still be interviewing on the 25th. I think that if we don't like who we see, then we then we open it. I just, I'm not, I'm, I, let's get the ball rolling. Like, we've wasted too much time. I'm, if we don't like what we see, then we move on and we go to, we open it back up. But I mean, these people, you're getting, you're now you're hanging, I mean, these candidates are going to think that we're not professional and that we just keep stalling them and dragging our feet and I mean to be honest with you if I was applying for a job and they kept doing this to me canceling rescheduling I just feel like I don't want to go look for another job mm -hmm. you know what I mean I do yeah. it's professionalism so I think that we either need to go ahead and interview them and <coughs> thank you okay. Mr. Ross <laughs> um, well that concludes the items on our agenda do you, you have no further comment. I'm no assuming. further comment. <laughs>